construct. We plan to make that very clear um, in the next round of, uh, of regulations. Um, in response to the December 23rd request um, by a committee member that SIDLAC produce a dashboard on its website that would uh, give a running tally of uh, remaining allocation both in total and by round. We're working with uh, our IT department to produce that and uh, hope to give you a further report at the February meeting as to when that will be available. The final thing that I'd like to address is the question of the March round and whether or not there's enough time for people who applied to SIDLAC for the <coughs> February round to, uh, to appeal their applications and if they lose, have time to file for the March round. What we're gonna do is we're gonna leave the January 17th deadline in place uh, so that we don't have to change any of our remaining schedule. But for anyone who applied to the February round and is either planning to appeal or waiting an appeal, uh, we will give you a one week extension to January 24 to get your uh, applications in for the March round. And with that, Madam Chair, I Okay. Are there any questions from the board members? Is that, is that clear? Yes, Gail. Thank you, and um, thank you again, Mr. Flood and Mr. Cass and your team for the dashboard. I think that will go a long way in helping us all know where you are. I really appreciate that. Um, and to Ms. Wilton and I can see that it's that suggestion as well. And in terms of the regulatory process, Mr. Flood, could you just talk about how you will engage stakeholders and get feedback on that? Yes, it's, it's been a process that uh, we've been going through, say, for the last uh, three or, or four months, I've received um, not only on the, uh, on the, on the treasurer's uh, 10 city tour, but also I've received, oh, I would say 15 letters from stakeholders addressing changes that they would like to see to, uh, to our regulations. And what we were planning to do for next week is to compile a list of all of those that we believe um, should be made, uh -huh. and to put that out for public comment next week. So, is there a deadline for the letters? Um, for those, that one, that one's mine. for those of you uh, on the other one, no, no, it's like forever just going streaming starting. <laughs> no deadline for the letters, but I think when we put out the list for public comment, um, stakeholders will feel free to not only address what's there, but to add things that, uh, that you believe should be there. So, I mean, I want to make this as open and, and, and transparent as possible. Okay, so um, right now, people can submit letters to you? Yes. And then when are you going to put... Yeah, an awful lot have. And I'm okay, going. but it's still open. Yes. Okay. Then you're going to... Then I'm going to put out a list of regulations changes for public comment, at which point people... Proposed. Can propose okay. the list. At what date? I'm going to do that on Wednesday of next week. Wednesday. Okay. And then after that, what's the time period for comments to the proposed reg changes? Typically, by OILs, we will apply to... <laughs> the comment period but we may leave it open as long as we need to um, because all we all we require is to have um, <coughs> what we're going to propose for our recommendation at the time that we set the agenda for the February 12th meeting so I think that uh, we will leave it open until then when because okay. there's five days for the emergency uh, regs but yeah. the standard um, rulemaking uh, the, the process is it's 45 days. So are we in emergency reg or? Emergency. We're in a, yeah. So we're emergency, emergency regs. regs. Okay, so then you will have five days <coughs> yes. open for? For public comment. Is it public comment or they're gonna submit in writing or what is the process? Um, all comments, yeah, they will submit in writing. Okay, public comment for five days, yeah. right? 
and then you will take it under submission, and then... And then we will bring it to the board at, uh, at the February 12th meeting, the February where people will meeting. again have a chance to come. Okay. And then after that, how many days do they have? Just they, they can come to that meeting, February 12th, to provide any additional public comments? Yes. And then? And then once, and then the board will vote. The board will vote, presumably at that meeting? Yes. Okay. Everyone's good? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I, uh, I just, I, I'm fine on the range. Okay. Yes. Any questions on that? Um, All right, Gail. Just one briefly, in addition to that, Mr. Fletcher, thank you Do you plan on holding a public meeting to seek comment? As staff from stakeholders, or is that not part of the process? You'll just take. I just want to make sure we that broadcast we, it widely and, and have lots of venues for comment. No, we had not. Uh, I guess planned because I think I said as a result of the of the intensity score and as a result of the fact that like you know most of our major stakeholders have already told me in one form or another what they think we ought to change. Um, our thought was that we were just going to put it out for public comment and send it out by listserv and, 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 and post it on, on our website um, and that we would get comments. Okay, so what are you going to post on the website? We're going to post all of our proposed changes. Changes. And then how about all the stakeholder letters? Why don't you just file it? People can look at it? Um, I can, we can put on the, uh, on the website, um, all the letters all that, we the letters get. that we get. Would you like to see all the stakeholder letters on the website as well? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. We Thank can do you. that. Thank you, Madam Any other requests? I, I, I'm all for better transparency, so. Thank you. <laughs> no, I appreciate the transparency. That's great. Yeah. Um, I, I just have another question on the, uh, the application venue for the, the, uh, applications to January 17th. Um, when do you plan on releasing the initial um, recommendations for the award? That yesterday. Oh, that came out yesterday. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Any members of the public wishing to comment? <clears throat> okay. Anyone on the phone? No. People on the phone are going to have to email, right? Okay. Okay, then we are going to move on to the next item, <coughs> item number four, determination and adoption of the 2020 state ceiling on qualified private activity bonds. This is an action item. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so every year we uh, calculate what the debt ceiling is for tax-exempt private activity bonds. Um, it's from an IRS uh, <coughs> guideline. There, it, it is a multiplier and a per capita formula. The multiplier this year is 105 per <coughs> capita. That has remained unchanged over several years. Um, what has changed is the Census Bureau estimate for California's population. Um, the estimate for uh, 2019 is 39,512, 223. Um, this is a 0.11 decrease from when it was reported in calculating the 2019 ceiling. So as, as um, what that results in is a 2020 um, state ceiling for private activity bonds of $4,148,783,415. This is $4.7 million lower than last year's ceiling. We ask that the board adopt the calculation of the uh, state ceiling for private activity bonds at four billion one hundred and forty-eight million seven hundred and eighty-three thousand four hundred and fifteen. I'll make approval for that, Madam Chair. Second. Okay. There was a motion and a second. Any members of the public wishing to comment? Okay. Hearing none. Um, Shall please call the roll. Yes. Gail Miller. Aye. Anthony Furkich. Aye. Kia Boatman Patterson. Yeah. I'm an ex officio. I am a non voting member in this committee. Zachary Same, same as me. I'm not a voting member. So. Okay. Um, Fiona Ma. Aye. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, the determination and adoption of the 2020 ceiling has been uh, approved.
approved. Item number five, consideration and adoption of the apportionment of the 2020 ceiling, ceiling among the state ceiling pool. This is an action item. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to remind folks that, first of all, a lot of the direction that was taken to come up with this staff recommendation uh, came out of the uh, meeting on December 23rd, uh, where we were directed, uh, first of all, to not have an allocation for single family housing. Um, and, to, and to put that into the multifamily housing pool. Um, to divide the housing and non-housing pools 84.34% for multifamily and 15.66% of our total ceiling to uh, non-housing exempt facilities. The other thing I'd like to point out is at that time, we also went through some work that we've done with CHP to come up with bond amounts that would be required for all of the state subsidy dollars that are available. And if you recall from that meeting, we said that all of the HCD program monies, uh, if they were funded, would result in a <coughs> total bond allocation of about 3.6 billion. Now that's just the ones that we thought would be available in 2020 and actually used for projects in 2020. Um, we also said that if all of the state credit dollars that were available were used to fund projects, that that would result in a bond allocation of about 1.8 to 1.9 billion. So what we're talking about is that if all of the just state money were funded, it would require a bond amount or bond allocation of about 5.44 billion. Now that doesn't take into any account rehabilitation and preservation deals. It doesn't take into account deals that are funded with local money and 4% credits and no uh, state money. So. I think that what I'm saying is that the idea should be very real in everybody's mind that we could get to the end of the year and there will be unused state credits and unused HCD money because we just simply don't have the allocation to fund all of those, uh, all those projects. Now, in coming up with the actual allocation, uh, I did pay close attention to a lot of the letters that I, I've received, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to post those uh, on our website as well. Um, a, a number of people uh, on stakeholders said that we should, that we should allocate 75% of the money that's going to multifamily to new construction. I think that we have come very close to accomplishing that goal. If you look at what's in our new construction pool and, and add to that what's in the mixed income pool because that's gonna be almost all new construction because of the CalHJ program and um, other money that I think that we get very close. Um, the other thing that I would do with my recommendation is that I would take the pot of money that we have in terms of allocation on hold and add that to the new construction pool. So what that would do and what our amended recommendation would be, would be that the general um, multifamily pool would have a total funding of 3,499,083.99. And that is the 84.34%. Within the multifamily, we would have a multifamily general pool, a multifamily mixed income pool, and a multifamily rural pool. Within the multifamily general pool, we would have sub pools for new construction, which we were planning to fund at. 
424-692-225. My recommendation would be that we add the allocation on hold to that, and I haven't done um, the math, but um, I can do that fairly quickly while I'm going through the rest of it. We were going to have a preservation pool of $522,317,000. Now, our regulations currently do not have a very good definition for preservation. Uh, part, one of the things that we want to accomplish with our uh, regulations change is to come up with a definition that makes it clear that we're targeting at-risk projects. And I think that we will be looking at the TCAT definition of at-risk um, as our sort of template for, for what the SIDLAC regulation is going to look like. So we're going to have a new construction pool, a preservation pool for at-risk projects, and then a pool that I'm calling Other Affordable, which is, we're recommending be funded at $387 million in change. That pool is going to be for anything that is not at risk preservation or doesn't um, comply with our definition of new construction. So it could be substantial rehab, it could be demolition, rebuild, it could be, um, you know, mod rehab, you know, but anything that doesn't fit at risk preservation or, or our definition of new construction would be in that pool. Um, in addition to the multifamily projects, we have uh, 10 million for industrial and in de development, and that's consistent with what we've done for the past few years for, for IDBs. Um, and then we'll have uh, another pool for other exempt facilities, which will be funded at 639 million and change. Uh, 300 million of that pool um, is uh, uh, reserved on a contingent basis for the Virgin Trains project. I think that, uh, that what we've also done in addition to the total pools is we've allocated each of the rounds and we basically just tried to since it's a, it's a competitive round, to allocate the pools fairly evenly um, across the um, sort of four additional rounds of uh, court uh, financings plus the, uh, the two exempt facilities rounds. And so I think that I'd like to present um, this chart as the staff recommendation for the apportionment of uh, the 2020 volume cap with the change that we take the 207 million <laughs> of allocation on hold and add that to the new construction subpool. Okay, Mr. Questions for board members. Gail? Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and again, Mr. Flood, thank you for all the I really appreciated the, of the, the meeting we had on the 23rd. Um, beca because this did just come out last night, I, I, I have some questions. I, I think it is somewhat consistent with what we've discussed, and again, really appreciate all of your work. I agree with you that moving the allocation <coughs> hold into new construction <coughs> makes sense. Um, in terms of other affordable, I'm a little bit confused. I heard you say substantial rehab. Uh, demolition rebuild is 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 there a way to get that definition perhaps in writing or is there a way to maybe collapse the pools and have them be more flexible in new construction and preservation? Yeah, I uh, I don't think our attempt was to define that pool at all. I think it was supposed to be a catch-all pool that says if you're not at risk preservation and you're not new construction per the SIDLAC regulations definition. <laughs> then you have to apply to the other affordable pool. And the at-risk preservation definition is already in your regulations? No, it is going to, that is. That's part uh, of what's coming. That's um, part of what's coming at the, at the uh, February 12th 
well cleared. Okay. In that case, would it be possible while we're defining at-risk preservation? I, I still don't know, just because I, I'm curious if it would be simpler to just have two pools, but if, if you think we need a catch-all, I, I defer to you on that. But I, I do think when we're looking at preservation, that's a, a follow-up question I have. If, if we could have a better sense of how you came up with the um, 522 million in terms of where and what the demand is, and if we believe preservation will be oversubscribed, I, I'd like to get a better sense and, and have some flexibility to revisit this number in the future once we have a little bit more information. Actually, I should have said that uh, you know that the board has um, the flexibility at any time to change and reapportion the and allocation. And again, I think the dashboard will be really helpful in that regard. And, and then my final point, in addition to, to agreeing with your suggestion that we move that 5% into new construction, would be um, would be to change the, and I'd like um, Ms. Silton Patterson's input on this as well, but would be to reduce the mixed income pool from 18.07 to 15%. And if I've done my math correctly, I think that would put an additional 126.5 million into the new construction pool. But again, I'd love Ms. Sloan Patterson's thoughts on, on that reduction as a means to, to try and, obviously our, our goal is to get as much investment in new construction as possible. I think the treasurer's leadership and the controller has been phenomenal. That getting these dollars out and, and knowing what we know about the demand, if we could make those two changes to invest more in new construction, and increase that production to solve the myriad of problems we have, I think that would, would go a long way. Ms. Altman, actually. So staff did review our pipeline and we had initially asked for a billion because we believed that was what was needed and going down to, what was it, seven? 749. 749, we, we thought we were gonna actually be able to exceed that. Um, so, but staff did run the numbers and think 15 would be really tight. I'm, I'm looking over at staff and they're, and, it, and it's all new construction. But I understand that the committee can make changes as it, at any time. So I don't want to hamstring ourselves, but going down to that 15%, knowing that this committee has that flexibility, but one thing that I would ask the committee to consider is for the mixed income pool, because it is over the counter, that you move round four up so that we don't have to wait and we could be submitting those because we're ready to submit applications to you in round one and two that will eat up all of pretty much our bond allocation. We have those shovel ready projects. Would it, could it uh, follow up on that? Would it be if we, if we reduce the mixed income pool and move that to new construction. Um, in, in theory, the mixed income projects, if you exceeded that 650, you could apply it through the new construction pool as well. Is that correct? Did they meet the definition for that? You mean if we? If, 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 if yeah. the 600 million or whatever the, the final number is, ultimately they would be able to apply it through the. I mean, either, yeah. either yeah. through a reallocation. They won't, they won't, they won't score yeah, they, they wouldn't they score high enough score high because high it's a different mix of units. That's why they have their own separate pool because mm -hmm. yeah. the scoring is targeted more at deeply targeted affordable as opposed to mixed income, which is literally why it has its own pool. Um, but w we can deal with that because we know we have several resources and we're all trying to get these resources out. So reducing it to 15, I know my staff is giving shooting me daggers right now, but yes. But I think most importantly would be to move our round four mixed income up so that they could be considered earlier. That's what's most important to us because we're sitting on those applications right now ready to give them to you. So, so rather than a third, a third, a third, you would want like half? I want it all in round one and round two, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and you'll, uh, my other concern is ensuring that you guys use all of that, again, based on the scoring. I think what we don't want to do is have this use the bond allocation on non-tax credit units to a large extent, and the mixed income pool allows for that. 
So I want to make sure that you guys use it all. Yes. And we're not funding, you know, 80 20s or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and just, you know, some rationale for what we did. Our demand study showed uh, 1.6 billion for new income, for mixed income demand. Um, Cal HFA asked for a billion, and we cut it back to. Yeah, there were several other issuers who responded for mixed income projects in the main year. Right, okay, so that is your Okay, yes, just a final comment on, and thank you for that, and Mr. Ferguson for your flexibility. I, I know this is all, I mean, obviously we can't meet the, the complete demand, but in considering where the highest priorities are vis-a-vis -vis production and, and new construction, I think this, the, the moves that we're suggesting strike the right balance <coughs> to increase and then obviously understanding that if the demand changes throughout the year, we can remain flexible with these pools. But I think increasing the total pool for new construction from, um, from where it is now by this additional, I think it'll be almost 330 million if we combine the 207 and the allocation on hold, and then we reduce the mixed income from 18 to 15, I think will go a long way to, to reaching the, the goal that we had previously discussed. So I think it'll take us up to, <coughs> should take us from 34.34% to 42.41% in new construction. I, I'm, I'm supportive of, of that as well. I appreciate um, college and base flexibility in this. We may just be sitting on some mixed income program dollars because we don't have any bonds. But the good thing about that is those hopefully will be carried forward for next year, as as the demand uh, is necessary. Um, I think the uh, I, I appreciate the moving the on hold over. I think the one thing that uh, Ms. Miller brought up that we need to discuss is the definition of preservation and at risk, because I think the narrower that definition is. The, the, the smaller that pool we need to be, and I think we should maybe talk through that a little bit as well, if, whenever staff's ready. So can we also just talk about the budget, like what the governor put in the budget in terms of 500 million more uh, dollars? Where is that supposed to go? What, may I? Just, just in the, this, the current budget, the $500 million proposal, is, is a trailer bill discussion, so that the specifics will go through trailer bill. Okay. So for now it is $500 million for the low income housing tax credit, which, and that'll be for actually next year's allocation. So I think those conversations are, are ongoing as to what the, how we distribute that. Um, from this year's 500 million, Ms. Hilton Patterson can speak to how much of that went to Cal HFA specifically for mixed Okay, so what I'm just trying to say is that as we are right. moving through this um, calendar year, we're going to get a better sense of yeah. uh, where perhaps we can allocate that additional money in this year's budget. Mm -hmm. I defer to Ms. Miller right. on that, so those will be part of the budget discussion. Okay. All right. Any other? I, I support that direction, no, not being voting, but I think that moving these things back fully. Moving up the mixed income program to round one and two. Absolutely. Okay, so do we need that to be a vote or? Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll vote as a whole, right? But I, we have we have the round one already. The application's already in for that one, right? Okay. So we know the dollar amount there. Yep. It's really the round two that we would move everything up to round two. Right. We yeah. want we want everything allocated between yeah. round two and three. Okay. Yeah. Moving up round four so that we can use. Okay, so we'd be round three on this list. Madam Chair, is yes. moving up the deadline a board action, or is that a, is that a staff? That's what I'm asking. Okay. Staff can do that. Staff can do that. Can do what? Can move up that mm -hmm. allocation. Well, if you're going to adopt attachment five as part of your resolution and it's incorporated in it, it needs to be incorporated in your change it. Right. In the minutes. Because you need to be able to change this chart. Okay. If it's going to be part of the. Resolution. Okay. So would you like to see a board action on that? Well, I think it can all be at one yeah. as part of item five. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, that's I need to make somebody needs to make relations with all of the. Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing I think would well, I, I, I would like to have some have a, have a little discussion about the, the idea of what preservation, what definition of preservation and at risk we're using. Um, and I, I think it would, if, if you have any ideas about what what you're planning on doing. Yeah, and I was thinking, I think, in my initial remarks that um, that a couple of stakeholders and, and a couple of the regulations changes that have been, um, you know, referred to me have said we should use the TCAG definition of at-risk preservation. Yeah. I, 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 I'm okay with that definition. I think it's it's a little narrower than some of the... the um, Stakeholders asked for at the last meeting in terms of uh, including uh, rehabilitation in excess and excess of a certain dollar amount. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, the the 522 million we have assigned for preservation may be too high if we use that narrow definition. Um, if we're going to expand the definition of that TCAC, or you have rehab in excess of a hundred thousand dollars a unit or something, well, why don't we? Then, uh, yeah, it, yeah. Could we work with? Stakeholders to see what <coughs> what they want as a definition. Yes, yeah, so part, of, and change part that of the emergency regs, it. right? Yeah. We're encouraging people to submit comments. Yes. Again, you'll have five more days, and the definition of preservation will be in there. Yes. And then another opportunity for that board meeting. The one more question: uh, if the emergency reg regs would be effective for the when would they become effective? What round? Or the May round? Yeah. For the May round. So for the the ones that. The January or the or February or March round, they would not be under right. existing. Regulations. It would be for applications with a March uh, deadline. So, so that makes it a little complicated in terms of who qualifies in that because there is no definition for preservation or address, right? In that that pool for for the for the, the March round. He's saying it may be yeah. tight. There may be tight, but I don't know. No, we, I was just conferring to make sure that, that we have not as yet received any allocations, uh, any applications for preservation for the March uh, round, and that deadline is the January 17th. <coughs> so I think we're okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, huh. Okay, hold on. Um, we're going to open up. I'll, I'll move to uh, adopt the uh, recommendation of staff with the adjustments that um, the on hold will be moved to the new construction pool. Um, the mixed income will be reduced to 15% of the total allocation with the remainder moved to the new construction pool. And the remainder of the mixed income allocation be moved to the round three uh, March allocation. It's around two. Is it round three or round two? It's on, on the on the thing. It's round four. Round three. Order moved to round three. Yes. Okay. I'll second. Oh, I'll second. <coughs> okay. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we're going to open okay. it up. Wait. I'm, I'm sorry. Time out. I'm sorry. We want to move round four and round three to round two, which is for March. Yeah, on, on, the, on the spreadsheet, yeah. okay. round three is March. Round three is March. March. Oh, I'm sorry. So, okay. so I moved the remainder to round three. So. Yes, you were correct. Okay. I, yes, apologize. Thank you. Um, Mr. Surdich, can I just add to your motion that that will bring the total board new construction to 42.4%, just out of an abundance of clarity for the record? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, before we take a vote, do we open it up for public comments? Yes. Yes. Okay. We're going to open it up for public comment. Any members of the public wishing to? So there was can you come up, come up to the mic, please, and sure. introduce yourself? Hi there. This is Kushat Mr. Leoglu. I uh, am in partnership with the CRP Affordable Housing and Community Development. My company's name is Miracle Investment. So we do have a project that we did application for, for the round. November 16, uh, it was an act rehab project, it's a hot chill two deal, and then something funny happened for some reason, 
TCAC staff or got to include in the list for January 15. So we don't need to resubmit this application, they told us. So it would be considered for it will be considered for March. March. <coughs> Just FYI. Okay. Yeah. So under the, the preservation folder. Uh, we did apply under the preservation okay. because you know it was kind of considered based on the interesting definition, which you know we thought that uh, it would qualify for this preservation. Okay. It's already under CCAC's definition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Good morning, Madam Treasurer, members of the committee. My name is Pedro Galba, and I'm the policy director of the, of the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. We are a membership um, affordable housing advocacy organization based in the Bay Area. And um, we are here to express gratitude for the changes that were made. Actually, many of my public comments were to address um, some of the concerns that were raised by um, Committee Member Miller and Committee Member Cernich, and it, we also appreciate the um, flexibility that Member Bobo Patterson has um, shown in moving over the allocation from the mixed income <coughs> program. So we're deeply appreciative of that. Um, my comments actually have to do with um, two, a, a couple of additional items that we hope will be addressed in the emergency regulations. Um, one is the definition of new construction. <coughs> Our members identified that under the current definition of new construction, projects that have to do um, significant uh, demolition and rebuild, where at least 75% of the units are in fact being rebuilt, don't meet either the new construction definition or the um, at-risk preservation definition. So finding a home for those projects is absolutely critical. Um, and we would hope to see that addressed. Um, another concern that our members have brought up, and this is more specific to the Bay Area, but again, it is crucial, is the bond, um, the per unit bond allocation limit. Um, that limit has it was set in 2017 and hasn't been adjusted. And this concern is shared by the mayors of Oakland, San Francisco, and San Jose, where um, the bond allocate, the per unit bond allocation limit is simply too low and will result in over 2,000 units in the Bay Area being ineligible for the tax exempt bonds. And we see this as critical to address, and, and this was also in a letter that um, I sent to the committee. And finally, um, we also wanted to address um, the issue with the application deadline um, that's currently set for this Friday the 17th. Um, many of our members haven't heard back yet on um, deficiencies with their application and they're requesting an extension to the 31st. We realize that this may cause more logistical issues, but we also think that that's important so that our members can address deficiencies with their application so that they don't have to submit again um, without necessarily knowing what was wrong in the first place. Um, and so um, with that, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Next. Maybe that was just yeah, the beginning. Yeah. That's all right, I'll stand. Doug Shoemaker, I'm the President of Mercy Island, California. Um, I want to echo a lot of what Pedro said, and I want to compliment Larry and the rest of the staff. I think the changes that are being proposed, particularly around moving more money to new construction, I think is in everyone's interest. Um, obviously, you have a really hard job this year. We're going to have a lot of disappointed developers and projects, and there's going to be a lot of money left on the table, and we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that um, as we move forward. With that said, um, I do think all the comments that are made about the relative demand in each of these pools and the need to re-examine the preservation pool um, and the other pools once we sort of have a little bit more information would be great. I would just ask, in addition, um, thinking about the fact that we don't have a really well-defined preservation um, definition um, and we have a round coming up with a significant amount of money and as to whether or not there are applications yet submitted or not, I don't think that's the right question. I think the question is, should you really have a round in which you don't have a really clear definition? Yeah. And, and I would argue that you should move that entire preservation round back until you have one. We do not have the money to squander on projects that are not of the utmost priority. And so uh, I, I know, I think all of us feel like it's really important to, ma to manage this resource 
really carefully this year, and I, I think I think you ought to move that back. Um, I do want to echo uh, one thing in particular that Pedro referenced relative to the demolition. As a project, so. So that people know more about it. Yeah, so Hope SF is a, um, an initiative started by um, now Governor Newsom when he was mayor. Um, it is um, a, a, a rather large effort to rehabilitate or renovate um, four of the largest public housing sites in San Francisco, the highest concentration of poverty in San Francisco. Um, those projects are proceeding now and at a really fast clip. We just passed a $600 million bond in San Francisco. And um, our project, as well as I'm sure the projects from Bridge and others, are expecting to apply for funds. And the process is we are in phases demol demolishing housing at a slow pace so that we relocate all of the families without displacing anyone. Um, as a consequence, we have a very tight schedule to make sure that we do this as quickly as possible. We're demolishing and rebuilding, and so it's critical that we get this funded in the year that we can so that we can move on to the next phase. Um, and it's, I, I think, the, the, one of the largest efforts at, at mixed income renovation of public housing in the nation's history. And I, I think to the extent that the regs and the process can support it, that would be fantastic. Okay, so complete demolition of all four buildings. The, the way the process works is we completely demolish a set of buildings, okay. we rebuild it, and the ratio of, of replacement housing to new housing differs from Round from project to project, but is anywhere between a half to three quarters of the units are basically replacement public housing units. Okay, so when you said you want them to be classified as new construction, right? So, okay, so I'm so those those buildings are are ground up new construction. Okay, they're replacing buildings that are functionally obsolete that have declared so by HUD. Okay, and so we're looking to sort of make sure that because they're neither a true rehab or a true new construction, and we find a home for them in the regs. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, they, they, were, they are more new construction. Okay. okay, thank you. Would it be, because I believe you said that the other affordable housing was to get at this issue that Mr. Shoemaker is talking about. Is that an easier way as opposed to, I'm trying to figure out what's the most efficient way to deal with this. Is it to redefine new construction so that it incorporates that? Or is it easier to have that subcategory that those projects could then fall within? I, I just, I'm trying to understand which way is it easier to I think get into. To, to your point about the mixed income community against other new construction projects, the, the scoring, <coughs> the like scoring works, so they may not score as well all the time. Okay. And so I, I, I was wondering if there's a narrow addition we can make to new construction just for demolition of public housing or? That, the, I think that would work. Really well, and I and I, you know, there are projects outside of San Francisco that are working on this. So major projects in Los Angeles and in Daly City and or other parts of San Mateo County, um, and, and I'm sure there are others around the state that I'm not aware of. And and we would and to Ms. Boatman Patterson's comment, I think as long as there's a home where they compete in a normal way based on the qualities of the project, whether they are in other or in new construction, we would be happy to spend time afterwards with staff trying to figure out the right solution. I think part of the reason that we created the other category was simply because we knew that that type of, uh, of, of rehabilitation didn't really fit our new construction uh, guidelines. And we didn't know whether or not adding it to our new construction definition would be controversial or not. So we decided it would just be easier to create another category. But we're, we'll right. and, and, and again, yeah. happy to I mean, I think you've seen some of these projects in prior rounds. Happy to work with you and anyone else that you would like us to to kind of figure out the right fit in terms of apples to apples comparisons on a project basis. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Would you defer, as you have suggested with preservation, not having that round until you have a definition? Are you recommending that not having a round for the other affordable be postponed until there's a definition as well? I, um, I, 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 I must. I, it's a good. It's a good comment. I think it's probably the right one. I, I, I hadn't contemplated it, but since you're putting words in my mouth, I, uh, I, mean, I know when to follow my lead. Uh, so, but I think the most important thing is we really have a very unclear definition of a number of different categories, and I think until they're defined, it's in everybody's interest to make sure that the right and the best <coughs> projects move forward. And given that you're accelerating or potentially accelerating the mixed income projects, I don't think staff will not be busy. Uh, so you'll have enough to do. Um, so thank you for the, okay. for the time. Is your project shovel ready, this Hope SF? 
All of these projects are so ready. Okay. So, and and you know this one is being led by related, but I think there are other projects out there that are important, and and I don't know where they sit, but but all of us are sort of effectively shovel ready at this stage. We're all waiting with bated breath. Okay. Thank Got you. It. Thank you. Did you have no. <coughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, yes. yes. Just a uh, follow up on the process for how we would delineate these applications for preservation and other. Mr. Flood, is that would that be a staff action? So you would wait until the board takes action on a definition, publish those <coughs> definitions, and then put those rounds out. Or what is the most efficient way to to alert the public of, of what the definitions are and when those applications are then due? I was thinking that we um, that we would get the the new regs that would contain all of those definitions approved at the next uh, at the next board meeting. Um, I guess whether or not we were going to, I guess because I created the other category, it never occurred to me that there would be a discussion about not having it there but putting it in new construction. So that's something that I need to. To, to think about, but uh, um. so I'd like to hear from board members and others. Should we, should we continue public comment? <coughs> yeah. Okay, all right, all right, yeah, let's do that. Okay, next. Good morning. I'm Alice Halcott with. I'm sorry, there, 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 there. Oh, <laughs> this seems to work. <laughs> I'm Alice Halcott with Mid Penn Housing. Thank you, um, and thank you to Black staff for all the hard work you're doing. I know that this has been a lot to do. I really want to echo um, Doug and Pedro's comments and add, particularly um, on the issue of we should not have a round if we don't have a definition for it yet. So I really would encourage putting preservation back, because I, I also think there's a real opportunity there potentially to move some of that preservation into new construction. I think given that the HCD money, there's over a, a billion dollars of NOFA money out right now um, these are projects that are high priority, you know, voter approved bonds that we really need to prioritize in every way we can doing those. And, and nobody's going to get everything they want. And I think that it's really important that we, um, that we really prioritize those HCD um, projects. Um, I also wanted to add the, to the conversation about the new construction definition. We, we have two projects that are uh, demolition of existing housing and rebuild. And part of what that's doing is that we're, this is a way not only to replace what's old and obsolete housing, but it's also a way to really get sites in really good areas and increase the density. So our site in Daly City is going from about 150 units to 550 units. <coughs> the way the definition is written now, it doesn't qualify for new construction. That doesn't make sense to me. It is new construction. <coughs> and there's a lot more money in the new construction pot than in the other <coughs> pot. So my concern is by keeping it in other, you really could be limiting these projects that I think are very high public purpose projects. And are allowed. we also have another, our other project like this is in Menlo Park right next to the Facebook headquarters. We're also increasing the density there from 91 to 142. So it's a way to get units in good areas and um, and have sites that otherwise wouldn't be available. So I, I, I really, I think you need to look at how much money is available, where it is, and adjust that definition. Thank you. Tony? Yeah, um, would, would there be a, uh, I mean, you talked about the thing about increasing density. Could that be another qualification, you know, at least mm -hmm. X percent number, more units or something? Yes, I think question. that could be part of the definition. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel Falcone with MacArthur and Salazar. And just to echo some of the t things that came up, uh, we are d working on uh, replacement and public housing units in San Francisco. We're doing it also in Sacramento. Um, so take, I think to set aside a category uh, and language associated with demolishing uh, public housing replacement is good. Uh, increasing density as a standard uh, measurement is also a positive. I think the key thing here is going to be the allocation of resources. If you heard uh, just in a few speakers, the number of activities going on across the state is, is large in this category. And if you put 300 million in that category collectively, you're talking maybe five, six projects for, for, the, for the year, and you have much more activity than that going on, and the projects are shovel ready. So I, I caution you uh, not to create a category, but then underfund it so much that uh, really urban, urban investment is, is, is missed uh, in this year. While it's competing with everything else, we understand it has to compete. No one's asking for 
they're not competition, we recognize that, but uh, we can caution that uh, we do it with sufficient resources to, uh, to address the urban neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I want to compliment everybody. Um, you know, Larry, I, you've had a, a really heavy lift since you've come. For those of you who don't know, I used to sit in Larry's seat. I had a much different problem than Larry did. We were significantly undersubscribed. And so some of those regs that are in place right now are there because we were trying to move allocation, not in an oversubscribed situation. I want to echo everybody's comments. I really appreciate the discourse and the commitment to move more resources towards new construction. I know this is um, probably lip service to everyone, but housing policy in California is predicated on boom and bust bond measures. Um, we, we get a lot of political will together, we pass a bond, we have a lot of money, we spend it, and then we need to go back to the voters and the legislature um, for more resources given the dissolution of redevelopment. So it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that the bond proceeds that have been approved are spent and we're able to put units on the ground. Um, given the oversubscription issues, I definitely understand um, the need to spread the allocation and that not everybody <coughs> will be funded, but I would um, suggest that when the committee is, is creating pools that there's parity with regard to demand and actually the pooling, um, given the demand for for HCD deals and state tax credit deals, um, you know, 1.4 was pulled for new construction, which are most of those deals because the HCD programs are pushing deals towards new construction bond program. So that's about a 28%. Um, I, I would hope that for preservation and mixed income, the pools are set up appropriately. All of the resources are important and all deals are important as well, but in an oversubscribed situation, I would, I would seek parity. And I think the increase in the new construction pool um, furthers that goal. A couple of other things um, that I want to comment on. Uh, I don't know how significant the reg changes will be to the FIDLAC regulations, but I think a five-day review and comment period, um, given um, the, the lack of knowledge about how significant the reg changes is, is, a, is a fairly swift process. Um, typically, uh, in years past, there has been a much longer kind of open dialogue with the community and a lot of input. My guess is that there's going to be some, some controversy with the changes and some need to really dig in and spend a little bit more time. So I would recommend a um, potentially a public hearing where everybody can, where the ideas can be vetted and there's more time. I know that means delaying the implementation of the reg changes. Um, a couple of other thoughts. I. Um, I concur with everybody's um, conversations about the lack of clarity of the pools. To the extent you wanted to keep things on track, I think the pools are outside of the regulations, and I think there could be a conversation today about what those definitions are. I think the TCAC definition for preservation is likely something that is very palatable, and I would recommend that if that were put into place, that the pool is large, um, there isn't a history of significant true preservation deals as TCAP defines it, and then the rest of the allocation be moved to the new construction pool. Um, one final comment on the definition or, or new construction deals. As a developer, everybody has a pipeline that they're concerned about. Um, from Jamboree's perspective, we're very engaged in permanent supportive housing, and we're doing a lot of motel conversions. And um, the concept, it's a little unclear from the regs right now. It says net new units. I think my question of clarification would be, how would FIDLAC view a motel conversion? Would you view that as, as new construction because technically they are net new units to the multi-family <coughs> pool? Or is that um, in the other category? And we would definitely, I know there's discussions about defining the other category, but we, we, we definitely want that pool of projects. Um, my, my guess is a lot of other developers who are doing permanent supportive housing have that same issue as well. So um, I, I really appreciate all the hard work. I know how hard this job is, and um, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy six months. And we we appreciate the support of the treasurer's office and all the hard work that staff is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Mr. Clark. 
suggestion is moving round four up so that we would have a round two which would be in February and a round three that would be in March and I'm looking over to staff to get confirmation. Yes, so the July application date would, have, would be eliminated. <coughs> May application. The, the May application. The May award date. The May award date. And then did you, did you still have the October award date? Yes. 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 Okay, so, right. I mean, if oh. you don't, you, can, can I bring the staff up so that they could address your question as opposed to having her talk? Kate, could you come to the microphone? Yeah. Kate Ferguson, um, Director of Multifamily Programs at Cal HFA. Um, our thought is that we have enough applications going in this week which will be allocated in March, um, that we feel like we're gonna need the May, a portion at least, if not all, of the May funding to come to the March allocation so we don't slow those deals down since they're all shovel ready, which is part of the requirement of our program. That doesn't mean that we won't, between now and March, or now and May, receive other applications. In fact, we expect to. Um, and in the event that any of the ones that are, are submitted this Friday for March, in the event that any of those are not funded in March, we would roll those out. So potentially having that, month, having that allocation come up to March allows us to make sure that we have sufficient allocation to keep the projects moving in a timely manner, especially if they're shovel ready. If something were to happen and a couple of those deals fell out, I would ask that the allocation would then roll probably we'd open the May allocation again. I, I understand it's, we need a little flexibility with this. What we're trying to do is keep the projects moving at a pace that's, um, that's real and not slow them down. So that doesn't mean that I don't expect we're turning in 12, I believe 12 deals on Friday. I expect we'll turn in more because it's on our, ours is an over the counter program. So, um, my hope is that if we don't use it all up in March, that it rolls to May, or that potentially we can move the October allocation up. I just don't have enough information to yet to inform a recommendation on that. And, and even despite these scenarios, there's still an October allocation. Yes, within yes. Just so everyone understands and that to would the be extent, contemplated, so I don't know if that helps. And to the extent all of the March allocation, that we didn't use it up with the 12 applications coming in right now, <coughs> Um, I would assume that we could move that back out to May. Just, just you know, the way the regulations are written now, if, if the March uh, allocation is not fully utilized, I mean, the mixed income projects that come in will be scored. Um, generally, the system set up so right. college pay will have higher scores. But if there's an excess amount of allocation that's assigned to March, March round, um, another project can come in and, and, and use that allocation. It's not reserved for college based projects alone at this point. Well. That's very true. The mixed income pool is not just for a mixed income program. Yeah. I don't. But to your point about using precious bond allocation for 80-20 deals, which has historically been the um, primary, I'm going to say, prototype that's gone through that pool. So um, you're you're right. My hope is that you know by moving that up, I'm we will be submitting through these 12 deals, I think, sufficient applications to eat up uh, that entire amount. Okay. We may in the future, though, ask that the October allocation be moved up so that we can address other. So that was just, I bet your 
Yeah, we'll post your letter today, and then we'll deal with we'll talk about after we okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, how are you? Adi Hagrash, I'm the Vice President of Carmen Ferrin Salazar. Um, I want to thank you for having us here. This feels like one of those really dramatic moments in housing policy and housing finance in, in the state at a moment when the housing crisis and homelessness is, is extreme. Um, so thank you for having this process and having to be as transparent as possible. I want to make two quick points. One is to reiterate um, comments of the past of um, the, the demo and rebuild and densifying and adding supply model is really important. There's been a lot written about and a lot um, talked about about how we have underzoned and undersupplied housing for too long and we need to dramatically increase supply and I support the governors and various state legislators' efforts to do so. Um, it's a very powerful tool, especially because often these parcels are owned by public agencies or nonprofits and so we don't have to shell out millions of dollars to buy new land owned by a third party, which of course is not basic eligible. Um, and that just adds to the project pro forma, adds to the gap, and it makes projects more infeasible. In this model, we spoke about Hope SF and other models. McCormick and Salazar previously has worked in, or is currently working in San Francisco at Alice Griffith, where essentially we're doubling the affordable capacity from about 250 units to 500 um, without paying any extra for the land. And so, I would support um, the idea to have densifying new construction, pro uh, densifying projects that include a demo and rebuild in the new construction bucket, as opposed to the much smaller other bucket, where we'll be duking it out with a lot of various type of projects that might have smaller public policy goals. The second is to advocate under the preservation category, um, to have it include not just at risk, you know, I think about a Section 8 contract that's about to expire, and, uh, not probably come in and purchase the building and the contract. Um, but also, uh, I would say financial at risk, and I think specifically about the transformative um, RAD refinancing program that uh, through HUD and California and various cities around the state, we have taken declining assets that didn't have, you know, section of contract that was about to expire, but essentially the, the operating subsidies from HUD were super low, expenses are what they are, uh, we can't maintain the property, we can't serve the residents, um, the buildings are falling apart. And so as you all know, San Francisco, Oakland, Fresno, San Bernardino have refinanced thousands of units using the RAD program. I don't think that technically would fit under the current at-risk definition, and so I would advocate for um, that to be included in at-risk, and certainly working with Cal HFA currently on three different preservation deals in San Francisco looking to refinance the projects to get a lot more income coming in to serve the residents and serve the buildings better. So just hope that those types of projects can be included in that presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Good afternoon, Marina White with the California Housing Consortium. Um, want to really echo the thanks and appreciation that people have already said to the committee and staff for your attention on this matter and appreciate the motion on the table to shift critical resources to new construction. Um, in this new era of limited bonds, it's critical that we're really mindful about the kinds of projects within each of those levels that are moving forward. And really want to echo the comments of Mr. Shoemaker, Ms. Glasser, about making sure that the emergency regs and the definitions are clear before we move forward with funding projects <coughs> and keeping the rounds ahead. Um, and we provided recommendations last month about definitions for, um, for preservation and We'll happily resend those again to, to get your attention. Um, so again, thank you for your time today. Next speaker. To get back on Southwest Airlines later today, this is the last comfortable seat I'm going to be sitting in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to change the subject a little bit. I. I'm impressed uh, with, with Sidlak and staff and all these. Oh, my name's Andrew Rose. I'm from Newport Beach, California. Um, I'm impressed with all the work that you guys have done in the housing area. But uh, I have an attorney who specializes in assisting clients with the financing of projects in the solid waste recycling, renewable energy industries, virtually all of which qualify as exempt facilities. So I want to thank you for your December 23rd uh, in principle decision to grant about 15% of the pool to exempt facilities. Um, I've been involved in a great number and probably actually majority of all financings done by the California Pollution Control Financing Authority since the early 1990s. Before that, I was the first executive secretary of the Alternative Energy Authority, now CAFA. 
I ask you to refer, reaffirm your decision on December 23rd. Argument is quite simple. We support giving the great majority of allocation to housing, but we also want you to understand, and I think you recognize, the importance of reserving some for our projects. This is not a zero-sum game where you choose one or the other major state goals, housing or continued leadership in climate change and other environmental goals. If any state can and should multitask, it's California. We understand the lack of housing stock. California is a crisis, but as becomes more obvious every day, climate change is not only a California crisis, but a worldwide one. And I won't even discuss the fact that offshore recycling markets have collapsed, which impacts the state's environmental goals and the ability of municipalities to comply with state mandates. The fact is that, unfortunately, I've been around long enough. SIDLEC has never failed to reserve a reasonable amount of allocation for its facilities, and I'm very pleased that uh, you are recommending that that continue. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, our projects are a little bit different in some ways, very similar in some ways, but uh, they, could, they present considerable risk, and yet the revenues of the project are for the most part controlled by the municipality which the project will serve. Uh, in California, solid waste management is directed by the state, but imposed on municipalities. And most of the municipalities in this state use private service providers to help them comply. So ultimately, it is my clients who have to bear the burden of financing these projects. <clears throat> There's a fine balance in that financing between attracting equity, having a sufficient margin of cash flow versus debt, while at the same time keeping the rate impact on residents and businesses as low as possible. Ultimately, they pay for them. Housing projects obviously need help, so do we. Um, I, I want to, on a positive note, remind you of some things that SIDLAC and CPC have, have done. And one of my favorite projects is a project which uh, <coughs> collects, uh, sends collection vehicles out to collect food and organic waste, brings it back, puts it in an anaerobic digester, creates gas, biogas, cleans the gas up, compresses it, put it right back in the trucks to go out and collect it again. So it's a closed loop system. By doing these types of projects, we avoid putting what we have been doing, which is putting organics in the landfill. That creates a, a, a greenhouse gas 70% more <coughs> potent than carbon dioxide. So California, again, as it has since the 1980s, is a leader in the environmental stuff. I think if you uh, confirm your decision on December 30, 23rd, you continue that. I don't want to say these projects aren't easy, and I sympathize with the housing folks. As I said, I live in Newport Beach, and they seem to have very little interest in adding to the housing stock in Newport. So I hope you all win on that one, by the way. Um, but, you know, the permitting of a, of a housing project is difficult enough. Uh, you know, try permitting a solid waste facility. It's, uh, it, it is difficult to impossible in this state. So we go through a lot of stuff. There's an old saw in the industry that they want us to pick the trash up, and they just don't want, it to put it, want us to put it down. Well, the good news now is with some of these projects, especially in the organic area, is that we don't have to put it down. We can put it into a facility, which will use it and reuse it, create alternative energy, create a compost project, which increase crop yields. It's sort of all good stuff. In summary, we should have done more to, pr to promote alternative renewable energy back when I ran that financing authority we'd be better off environmentally than we are today. But one thing is for certain, your support is important because the last thing we should do is give up on these projects now. Thank you very much. Thank you, maybe uh, Gail, you know, the governor also put a billion dollars into a revolving loan um, climate catalyst fund. And there, I recommend you let the treasurer run it. <laughs> it's on the it's on, it's on, I think. Yeah, so I don't know if you want to. So, but um, there is going to be more money for these type of uh, climate change, um, green, reusable energy uh, type of projects as well. So that's good news if, if the legislature also gives us blessing. All right, next speaker. There. Veronica Pardo, on behalf of the Northern District of the California Refuse Recycling Council, I want to echo many of the comments of Mr. Rose today, but thank you uh, for your, well, I'm in support uh, in the hopes that you're going to reaffirm your December uh, 23rd decision to reserve approximately 15% of the statewide value of cap allocation for exempt facilities. I think Mr. Rose did an excellent job of describing the great need we have. We're looking at about a tripling of our infrastructure needs when it comes to organics management if we're going to meet our ambitious um, state diversion goals. And this really is a climate change goal, climate change initiative. I was 
interested when I came in the building today at your climatic uh, wealth um, statue outside of the building. And it made me think about, you know, just how important this work is to meet these uh, climate resiliency goals and really just reduce our methane emissions overall. So uh, really thank you. Uh, we have a $40 billion potential price tag to achieve uh, the goals of SB 1383. So we really do need your help. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andy Madera. I'm Senior Vice President for Real Estate Development at Eden Housing. Um, and I think like some of the other uh, speakers, uh, uh, we also have an acquisition, rehab, and new construction deal, uh, which honestly has, it has Couch of A, it has HCD, uh, it has ASIC funds, it has local funds, it has Facebook funds, it has everything you could possibly imagine. It is actually all fully financed other than the bonds for which we're ready to put in our application on Friday. But it is also uh, extremely complicated and it doesn't really easily fit into a new construction budget. Uh, like it, it doesn't easily fit into a preservation bucket. Um, we're throwing it at you. Uh, we're not, you know, we've been talking to you about it, um, trying to understand um, how the sub-allocation process is going to work and how the sub-allocation allocation process is going to impact um, these sorts of deals that don't only fit into one bucket or another. Um, it's also not San Francisco. It's not a public housing deal, um, so it doesn't fit into either of those sorts of characterizations either. So um, we just uh, look forward to working with you more on trying to create flexibility for these types of things that are still essential, that are still adding uh, new affordable housing stock, um, but are not easily can you just give us a description of your project? Sure, this is called uh, Light Tree. It's actually Light Tree Phase 2 and Phase 3. Um, it is, off the top of my head, 195 units at the end. Today it is uh, around 95, so we are uh, knocking down. Hold on, I have to go look at my text of notes to me. Uh, Where? East Palo Alto. Uh, we are. Um, Rehabbing 57 units, we are demolishing 37 units, and we're building back 128. It's got no place like home, it's got ASIC, we are buying an electric bus, we are putting in bus oh, rapid yeah. transit. It's like, you know, what else do you want? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Try to get everything. Yeah, make everybody <laughs> happy. Couch of Faye is the issuer. There you go. Wow. So, right. um, uh, just, Listen, you know, my good comments, idea thank people. you for your, yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Can I ask yeah. just on this, how much flexibility, given, given what we're learning about other affordable, I, I understand we may define it, <coughs> certainly don't need to decide today, but in addition to these definitions and delaying the applications until they're defined, I wonder if Mr. Flood, if you and your team could look at combining new construction and other affordable for maximum flexibility, that doesn't work. Okay. No, I, th I think what we, we could look at is, um, depending on how we define preservation pool, mm -hmm. we might be able to move some of the preservation to oh, other maybe pool. preservation. So I, I, I am interested in, in just how we create more flexibility for these other <coughs> projects because they seem but I think I think it's it's clear that a, a clear definition of, of both new construction and preservation is necessary. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next speaker. Okay. Uh, my name is Tracy Adams. I'm the co-chief executive officer of Green Waste Recovery. So I'm going to take us back to the environmental side, the recovery side, the recycling side for just two minutes. Uh, I want to first off say thank you to CIDLAC as well as the CPCFA for the past funding and looking forward to continuing with the December 23rd recommendation. We are one of the companies that has built uh, one of these anaerobic digestion facilities and I just wanted to come back and explain a little bit um, what you guys have done for us. So with the funding we received in the past, um, approximately half of our project was covered by the tax exempt fund. Without these bonds, we could never have gotten this funded by a bank. As it stands, we've now been able to take all of the commercial organic waste from the city of San Jose and turn that back into power. We now run a 1.5 megawatt facility, giving green power back to the city of San Jose. So on behalf of myself, my colleagues throughout the state, 
Uh, this is critical to what we do. We wanted to say thank you and ask you to please reaffirm the December 23rd decision. Go next day. So let's uh, go back and revisit the uh, motion that's on the table. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, revisit with the questions that, that, that what we heard. Did you have? Um, my, my only question, I'll reiterate it, is just how we ensure that we can, that folks have the definitions of other affordable and preservation ahead of the application. Yeah, and I think, well, I think the other affordable is going to be a catch-all category. Right, but I just, I, I do think until we've defined new construction and preservation, if it's a, if it's sort of everything else, folks would need to know those two pieces, right, before they know what other affordable means. Okay, I think right now new construction does have a definition, at mm -hmm. least, and it's, It's fairly long, but it doesn't include. I mean, but it's it's only construction of of new units. It does not include uh, demolition or or substantial, substantial or renovation yeah. or conversion. Yeah, the, the definite. It's actually. It just says 100% of its units constitute new units to the market and expressly excludes any project that involves rehabilitation or any construction affecting existing residential rental units. So what if it's not an existing residential rental unit? Well, I think I think that gets into the motel conversion. Yeah. Yeah. That would help that, but not all the other. But, but no, it's, it's the 100% of new units that yeah. would be challenging. Yeah. And if I may, I mean, I know Mr. Sir is speaking to it, but I mean, I think we're adding units that should be provision of this. It's actually something that we've obviously strongly encouraging cities to do mm -hmm. in terms of increased densities, and we, we want to make it easy. I think it's like a threshold. Yeah, that. exactly. If you were adding units added in affordable housing, um, that is new construction of units to the market. So I think it's a hundred percent provision that maybe the monkey would, if you went if you went the direction of new construction or modifying that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So for the catch all, what I'm I'm understanding is <coughs> there's a definition that's fairly clear of new construction. If we take on the TCAC definition for preservation, we have a clear definition of what preservation is. Mm -hmm. And if we keep the other for everything else, mm -hmm. which I think that's what I hear the board saying, that we don't really need to define everything else. Is, is that what I hear you all saying? It's just kind of a catch-all? So how would the catch-all be scored? Because that's not clear to me, because if you, like mixed income doesn't compete well in the general pool. Are these projects that are other going to be scored amongst themselves or are they going to be scored like the general pool? I'm, I'm not clear on that. I think our, our, current, our current scoring guidelines only distinguishes mixed income. Everything else is on equal foot. So I, I guess then my request, Madam Chair, because I, I, I certainly don't want to define preservation right here. I, I, I'm not as familiar with the TCAC definition. Um, but what I would like to see, perhaps, Mr. Flood, when you come back, in addition to clarifying the deadlines for these projects, is perhaps just a, a very short summary of the other pool and how, how those would be scored. I think that would be helpful in February to understand the definition of preservation and the, and the demands that would accompany that. If, if we're Reduce, if we're narrowing that definition, I think that what we allocate may be too high. Understand the what this other affordable catch-all pool will look like, and then the the scoring for that other, and then finally the deadlines for these pools, the application deadlines for these pools. Once everyone knows what the definitions are, is that a fair request for February? I'm not sure that I'm getting the application. Well, I think what we heard is folks don't want to necessarily turn in the application oh, without the definition. Time that they have okay. the definition. So I just think in this no, in the fine. staff report, it would be helpful to know what your planned application okay. deadlines are. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to um, recommend though that if for, for any applications that have been submitted, you know, for for the March round, that we should probably have a placeholder definition for these. 
Um, I mean, I think we have the new construction definition. I think that works. I'm sure if any preservation projects have applied, but if they have, if there, if there's one. One, we might want to we might want to use the TCAC definition as a placeholder, and then the emergency rates could change yeah. that um, if if we decide that we want to revisit yeah. that. If that works, I think that works. Yeah. That project clearly and, and joint application. I'm comfortable with that. I I I, I wasn't quite prepared for that. I, I so I would just reserve the right to after studying that to come back and have um, the preservation conversation, but as a placeholder <coughs> definition so that these can be processed, I think that makes sense. Yeah, and I think the whole purpose of us, you know, convening or, you know, this year is really the streamline. So to the extent that the definitions are clear uh, under both TCAC and SINLAC regulations, uh, I think it makes it easier uh, for the public versus it's like federal and state tax conformity, you know, when you have to like, you know, file different forms because the laws are different. It's, it's really, really hard for uh, taxpayers as well as, you know, stakeholders out there. So to the extent we can keep it like similar, the same, um, I think it'll make everybody's life easier. And, and as, as I mentioned earlier, I think the one thing about the TTAC definition is it's pretty narrow. And so assigning, I think getting uh, $500 million in bond allocation that is going to be uh, very high. So I, I'm, I'm okay leaving it where it is now, but maybe revisiting that in February mm -hmm. and, and shifting some over to new construction if we decide or wherever. I, um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, Mr. Sergich, I, I do think you may need to yep, amend your motion I will to, amend my include, motion. Um, to not only include the definition of preservation, but I don't think your motion included the, the exempt and industrial development. Well, I just said we'll do the recommendation. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. So I, I will amend my uh, uh, motion to accept staff's recommendations with the uh, moving the um, allocation on hold to the new construction sub pool, um, reducing the mixed income pool to 15% of the total with the remainder going to the new construction sub pool um, and moving the round four nope. mixed income round, yeah, round uh, four to, to three. round yep. three um, and finally um, defining the preservation sub pool as the TCAC at risk definition um, unless, For purposes unless, of this unless amended, only. In, right. unless amended uh, in emergency regulations. Unless an Could I argue with the May? There was a May date in there. I don't know. The May were. coming up to, to March round four. Yes. So that was a great. I, I, so I think you covered it all. I would ask that as we continue to assess this, that. Should college base mixed income, since we are now taking other things around and pumping them all into new construction, college base program <coughs> is a new construction program. And so please consider that. And should we come back in February and have that 3% red shovel ready and ready to go that we consider moving some of those things yeah, around? We, we would love to consider any and all possibilities. Thank you. <laughs> so I will second your motion, Mr. Sergeant. Yes. Okay. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Um, please take the roll. Gail Miller? Aye. Anthony Thurkich? Aye. Fiona Mall? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item number six, determination and adoption of the 2020 state ceiling on qualified public educational facility oh, bonds. Is that uh, number six? Yeah, um, so that every year, as early in the year as possible, the other state ceiling we set, which is separate and distinct from what has been uh, currently passed, um, is a ceiling for uh, qualified private activity bonds for public education facilities. It's primary, secondary education facilities uh, specifically. And uh, the IRS has a, again, provided a per, per capita formula of $10 per capita. Um, using that basic formula and the census uh, information that has been sent, um, we would be recommending to the board uh, the uh, total state ceiling for uh, uh, private activity bonds for uh, education facilities of $395,122,230. Okay. 
Move to adopt the ceiling. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, please call the roll. Oh, sorry, public comment. Any members of the public wishing to comment? Okay, seeing them. Aye. 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 All right, motion carries. Item number seven, delegation of authority in the absence of the executive director. Yeah, I, I think this is, one is, is, is quick. Uh, there have been times uh, over the past six months, and I believe that it happened prior to my arrival as well, that uh, uh, executive director and members of the executive office have been traveling, and documents needed to be signed at CIDLAC. Um, given that there is no designated de deputy director for CIDLAC, uh, I'd like for the committee to delegate uh, signature authority to Evan Kass, um, who, with my permission and with consultation with me, would be able to sign uh, documents for SIDLAC while I'm traveling. Move approval. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Okay, motion carries. All right, item number eight, recommendation for regulation changes. This is an action item. Yeah, um, these are actually two that we believe are fairly uh, non-controversial. Um, the first uh, came about uh, as a result of this particular round. Um, you know, we have to review applications for completeness before we score them and like them, and we saw a lot of problems this round with um, attachments being put in the wrong place. Um, and probably the most significant problem was in several cases we got uh, bank commitment letters where the pages were uploaded, were only the odd pages, and all of the numbers and signatures were on the even pages. And, you know, there was really nothing we could, we could do with it. Um, my thought was rather than rejecting applications because of just, you know, silly uh, errors that we give uh, applicants uh, one business day to cure uh, items that they are told are deficient. Um, and if those items are not cured within the one business day, then the application would be deemed incomplete. So. Yes, thank you. We've heard a, a lot of... Um, some applicants, for some reason or another, didn't upload one page, and you know, under our current regs, um, it says that if they are incomplete, then we are going to reject it. So we're trying to be a little bit more flexible, right? If um, an application comes in, there's even pages, but odd pages are missing. Well, someone didn't, you know, uh, scan and send that in. So I mean, obviously, the application should be still deemed complete. So that's the yeah. reason for this proposed reg change. And so I guess the, the change would be to section 5,000. Know, the last sentence currently reads, the committee will not consider an application that is deemed incomplete by said like staff. We would propose changing that. Um, what is this? 24 hour period. Yes, to add if, if, if deficiencies in the application are identified by said like staff and the applicant will have, this is 24 hours, but we'd like for that to be one business day just so that we don't have to do this on weekends. Um, from the staff issued notification to cure deficiencies. Okay, any comments? Board members? Any members of the public? Anyone support it from the public? Okay. All right. Is there a motion? Move, move to approve. Second. Okay. There's a motion. A second. Michelle. Gail Miller. Aye. Anthony Furtich. Aye. Fiona Ball. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Right. Second. Yeah, item number nine. Um, actually, there's a oh. there's another another part on, on, on item. Oh, eight. right. This one was. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests from the development community to provide information um, sooner. And uh, what we found is <coughs> TCAC generally requires developers to self-store so that immediately upon receipt of applications, they can post a self-score ranking so that developers see if you're near the bottom and you have no chance of being funded, you can like 
form alternative plans relatively quickly. SIDLAC mm. does not have currently in its regulations a requirement to self-score. We would like to add a requirement to self-score so that uh, so that we can do the same thing, so that we can put information upon receipt out about what the um, general ranking looks like so that developers and sponsors can make decisions earlier about whether they want to stay in a round or find alternate financing. You're not on mute. <laughs> and I just wanted to make sure that and, and make clear that you know, this is not in lieu of SIDLAC Skid, of doing its scoring and posting and its preliminary and final recommendations. We're going to do that. We just figured if we published a self score earlier, that uh, that would be beneficial. Sorry. I move to approve. Okay, there is a motion second. Any members of the public wish to comment? Hearing none, Michelle? Please call the roll. Gail Miller? Aye. Anthony Thurkich? Aye. Fiona Hall? Aye. Okay, motion carries. All right, if we are on item number nine, um, are there members of the public who wish to uh, make a public comment but have a flight that needs to leave? Yes. We've been we asked, asked to accommodate. Oh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, please mute your phone. Thank you. Without hang up. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> to the um, woman who is speaking on the phone, can you please mute, mute your phone? We can hear everything you're saying. No longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so. Spencer, can we take public comments so that they can catch their flight and then we'll Absolutely. go on? Okay, I'm sorry. Public comment first and then thank you. Thank you for your time. No, thank you. And I'll be real direct. First District Supervisor, San Bernardino County. Uh, from an economic standpoint and housing and a variety of other issues, the <coughs> Bright Line Train Project is fundamentally the right project in the River Valley. <coughs> if we look at housing component alone and we look at the disparity of the burden throughout California, Victor Valley has one of the lowest, support, one of the most affordable housing market. We also export 90,000 daily commuters. Uh, this will create a direct 12,000 jobs during the development, and it's eventually going to lead to a pipeline of development into LA County, who partners with us. This is one of the most important economic stimulus within Southern California. And from an environmental standpoint, if you want to bring relief to the LA basin. 50% of the freight travels from the port through the high desert. This will create a pipeline to do so. So I look to consideration the continued support. It's one of the most important economic projects in Southern California. Thank you for so allowing us. your name? Uh, Robert Lovingood, First District Supervisor, San Diego County. Thank you. Thank Good you for the opportunity. Thank you. <coughs> so I'll sit. So thank you for uh, taking us uh, ahead of time. Not miss our flight. Southwest is backed up on every flight at this point today. So, uh, my name is Doug Robertson. I'm the former city manager of Victorville, current uh, Apple Valley town manager, and elected board member and vice chair of the Victor Valley Chamber of Commerce, whom I also represent here. Uh, one of Governor Newsom's main priorities is housing, calling for 3.5 million new housing units by 2025, as I know you all know. Uh, he famously said during his first state of the state address, "If we want California for all, we have to build housing for all." Uh, in years following the Great Recession, the Victor Valley region has been very slow to recover, with only modest growth averaging roughly five to 600 units uh, per year. Apple Valley, my town, uh, just we had just 79 new units in 2018, had a slight uptick in 2019 of 101. We think that's mostly due to uh, code changes, adding some new stringent requirements. It's yet to be seen if all those are actually gonna be built, of course. So. Uh, those numbers pale in comparison to the mid-2000s, uh, when the region would contribute more than five to 6,000 units per year and was among the fastest growing regions in the nation. Uh, in the wake of uh, the decisions made uh, by this board and others uh, last year, uh, late last year, uh, uh, the approval for the use of California's debt ceiling for tax exempt private activity bonds, uh, the building industry association in our area is really ramping up development. We find a lot of new meetings going on. Uh, for development planning type of activity. So further funding and approval by the committee today would serve to make this project a reality and will spur economic activity and business growth where it is urgently needed in inland California. Uh, this project will not only fund new housing, it will spur thousands of new 
housing opportunities of all types. My planning staff in Apple Valley are currently working on new zoning designations to take advantage of the rail service opportunities and other development that will naturally grow around it. Uh, this includes the first of its kind in Apple Valley, multifamily zoning that increases from our current standard of 20 units per acre to 50 units per acre and higher, potentially. Uh, just last night, in fact, our town council formed a multifamily ad hoc committee to review and recommend changes to our current development standards to encourage new multifamily development. We're really excited about that. Uh, the Victor Valley region is prepared to deliver the housing the state has identified as needed, and this project is imperative to generate that private investment in inland California. Throughout the region, uh, just a few numbers, uh, there are over 50 undeveloped recorded track maps containing over 5,000 undeveloped recorded lots. Uh, these have cleared all entitlements, and developers could literally pull permits tomorrow and start construction immediately. Uh, there are also about 70 approved tentative maps with over 6,000 approved tentative lots. Uh, these are at various stages of entitlement, but certainly are, could be ready very, very soon. So some may question how a train addresses the housing needs of California, but in the Victor Valley region, it's the economic engine that's needed to generate the private investment in good options for California's housing for all. Thank you for your consideration today. The entire Victor Valley region urges your approval. Thank you. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, Madam Treasurer. It's good to see you. Uh, I'd like to read a quick statement from the uh, Building Industry Association that was sent to this committee. The Building Industry Association of Southern <coughs> California View uh, uh, Balding Mesa chapter is a leading advocate of thousands of building industry leaders who are committed to a better future for California by building communities, creating jobs, and ensuring housing opportunities for everyone. I'm writing uh, on behalf of the BIA in support of Virgin Trains USA tax exempt bond allocation request that will be considered at the California Debt Limit Association Committee meeting on January 15th. As California's population continues to expand and the state transportation infrastructure strains under the pressure of nearly 40 million residents, private investments should be encouraged when possible since government alone cannot fund our state's ever-growing transportation demands. Bonds requested are backed by private investors with no risk to California taxpayers, yet the benefit to the public is substantial. The private funding interaction rail system planned by Virgin Trains USA will improve mobility in California, remove cars from our congested highways, reduce harmful carbon emissions, create thousands of jobs, spur transit-oriented development and uh, contact relations between uh, residents between Victor Valley region and the housing and employment opportunities. As California faces housing, uh, a housing crisis of historic proportions, the uh, project of this magnitude will create well-paying jobs in a region that provides opportunities to increase home ownership and economic growth. And I'll leave copies of the letter as from the director of the BIA for Southern California. Just for my own note, and I and thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to make our flight. We, came up at 4 o'clock this morning, so we're we're ready to get flying back down to Southern California. Yes, yeah, I used to run the floor in the assembly, and same thing. If we didn't adjourn in time, we had to change everybody's flight. And flight. there are none so. this afternoon, so oh, we're we'll all booked. So. Well, then, make sure you catch it. Um, on behalf of the town council, we cannot tell you what this means to not only our community, but our region of over a half a million people. You are providing the ability for a public-private partnership that is going to be able to move the high desert, the Victor Valley area, desperately into the last century. We're sort of behind by decades. You're giving us the opportunity to move into the current century and be able to provide economic basis growth. We're actually considering things for multifamily, like 50 units to an acre. We've never even considered that. These are things that we're looking at to be part of this program. Um, I can't emphasize how important this is. And I have to tell you, I'm, I've been out speaking to everybody that'll talk to me. And the second I tell them that the state, and this is a private public partnership between the state of California and a private organization, they're all going, this is the greatest thing we've ever seen come out of Sacramento in years. So on behalf of my town, my community, my home, I want to thank you so much. and. I wish I could be here for the book. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Treasurer. 
Hello. Steve Hoffbauer. I'm the uh, mayor of Palmdale. Uh, city manager and I uh, came up here. Um, I, uh, I appreciated your comments recently at the uh, Contract Cities Association. Um, I think that uh, you understand the importance of, uh, of a project like this. Uh, the, uh, the city of Palmdale uh, joins with our neighbors and our partners in the Victor Valley and San Bernardino in support of the Virgin Trains and the approval of the tax exempt bonds for the privately funded rail corridor between Las Vegas and Southern California. Virgin Trains inner city passenger system is an important step in the evolution of uh, mass transportation networks. The connection initially between Victor Valley and Las Vegas will serve as a vital link between the high desert corridor to connect Palmdale, the Antelope Valley, and Victorville. We're ready to go for, the next, for this next uh, connection as well. The use of the rail offers an opportunity for smart development as these systems are designed to mitigate the traffic congestion, manage efficient movement of people through and uh, in between in between urban centers, and uh, protect our environment through reduced carbon emissions and healthier air quality. All you got to do is look at that 15 on any weekend, and there's no doubt in anybody's mind that this is a good idea. Uh, the public benefit of the system can be measured in more productivity, more economic activity, more access to jobs, increased property values, less cars on the road, reduced dependence on fossil fuels, and overall uh, better quality of life. Uh, we had a chance, uh, as I believe you did and uh, many other people in this room, to visit the Virgin Trains operations in Florida last year. They've accomplished something out there in a very short period of time. Other, other attempts have uh, not come close. Um, realizing Florida's long-term goal of building viable inner-city rail systems, uh, they've transformed the neighborhoods and the areas where they've gone into. I believe this mode of private investment for rail and the infrastructure is scalable is a scalable model. These bonds are designed specifically for projects like this. Finally, not only will this investment create a transportation <coughs> hub, but the future connection to Palmdale will impact housing and jobs. Uh, Zach Oldenstein and I had uh, spoken about that last time we were up here, and uh, we're going through the RENA process right now, and uh, I think this will help um, this will help realize the state's um, uh, goals on, on housing production, uh, as well as providing something that's going to be fabulous for the upcoming Olympics. City manager and I traveled here to wholeheartedly support this. We thank you for your time and your consideration on this issue. We're available for any additional uh, questions that you might, may have. Thank you, Mayor. And, th and thanks, we're in the same boat of playing okay. as, <laughs> as maybe. <so. laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Keith Metzler. I'm the city manager for the city of Victorville. And I'm here on behalf of our mayor, Gloria Garcia, who couldn't make the trip, to show our support for the Virgin Train high-speed rail project. For those that don't know, Victorville is approximately 90 miles north and east of Los Angeles in the high desert region of San Bernardino County. Our population is about 125,000, uh, with a regional population nearing approximately a half million. Um, and, and with that, we have a household income of about 53000 annually. We're considered one of the most affordable places to live in California with a median uh, sales price of $269,000. Because of our affordability, we're a traditional bedroom community and in that a large percentage of our population commutes for employment outside the area. We are home to the former George Air Force Base, which closed in 1992 and has since been transformed into the Southern California Logistics Airport in an effort to recapture an estimated 8,500 jobs uh, that were lost in connection with that closure. Victorville has since been successful in attracting uh, major industry companies such as Boeing, uh, General Atomics, General Electric, uh, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, and Newell Rubbermaid, just to, just to name a few. City of Victorville supports uh, Virgin Trains, the Virgin Trains project, because we believe the influx of private investment will serve as a catalyst uh, for overall economic growth. Uh, in the area, both over the short term uh, construction period and over the long term. Victorville is uniquely interested in seeing the Virgin Train Project provide our residents with commuter access to another labor market. Interestingly, if you compare where our local commuters from Victorville and the Victor Valley commute to, locations like Los Angeles, Orange County, Riverside County, and even San Diego County, our local road warriors are accustomed to being in their cars for at least three hours. Uh, or more uh, round trip. 
The Virgin Train Project offers our residents a round trip to the Las Vegas labor market and under that time. We believe that not only will this provide our residents with additional access to employment opportunities, it will increase the demand for our affordable housing. The Virgin, Train, the Virgin Trains project, if approved, could also pave way for additional phases of high-speed rail that could connect Palmdale and Lancaster uh, to the Victor Valley uh, region. Uh, this ultimately will provide direct rail access to the major marketplace, which is downtown Los Angeles. Altogether, this project has a huge potential in not only providing our region uh, with much needed economic development, but it stands to improve air quality by removing cars from the road. Thank you for your past support. Thank you for your continued support. And thank you for allowing me the time to speak. Thank you. Anyone else have to catch a flight? Okay, then we will proceed back to the agenda item. Our speaker. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Richard Fisher. I'm here to present item number nine on the agenda. Consideration of appeals and applications for the allocation of state, city, land, qualified private activity bonds for the exempt facility project and award of allocation. The committee received one application for an exempt facility program from the Express West Passenger Rail Project. This was from the applicant, California Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank. <coughs> also known as the iBank. iBank will issue $2.4 billion of tax-exempt bonds to find, excuse me, fund the construction of a high-speed intercity rail service between the Victor Valley, California area, and Las Vegas, Nevada. Staff recommends approval of $300 million in 2019 bond allocation and $300 million in 2020 allocation to iBank for the Express West project. Staff further recommends that the award of $300 million of 2019 bond allocation and $300 million of the 2020 bond allocation be conditioned upon the receipt of an economic development plan that outlines their goals in the areas of housing, jobs, and workforce development to the satisfaction of the chair and the executive director, and a letter from the Federal Railroad Administration acknowledging their acceptance of the NEPA and EPA report submitted with the SIDLAC application. Okay. Um, just presentation by the. Add one. Yes. Comment, and that is that the. Uh, as a, Richard mentioned that the iBank is issuing $2.4 billion with the allocation that we provided. They're also issuing another $800 million of DOT back bonds <coughs> or, or DOT allocation bonds in addition to what that, that $2.4 million. So they're actually issuing $3.2 billion. But then Nevada also is, is going to allocate $800 bond cap, which will enable them to do the 4 to 1. That's yes. correct. That's correct. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so maybe we'll do a presentation. Uh, I'd like to move for the good professor's presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Hussein Cumber, and I serve. There's no presentation. <laughs> For the next one. Next one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I got a little offended. Everyone turned around. <laughs> um, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Florida East Coast Industries, and we're the parent company to Express West. Um, I'm going to very quickly um, just remind everyone of our company's history with the project Express West and provide some highlights on its progression since we took over the project. Bright Line, now Virgin Trains USA announced our plans to acquire Express West in September 2018, and we closed on the transaction in March 2019. Even before we finalized the acquisition, my colleagues began working to revise the design and submitted 15% design plans in January 2019 at Caltrans and Nevada DOT. This was quickly followed up with the selection of a construction management firm and the kickoff of a 60% design package. I mention all of this because it shows the focus as well as the human and capital resources we have brought to bear in the last 12 months. 
We also engage with stakeholders in the project from day one, both in California and Nevada. Local, state, and federal partners have been constantly engaged, and many of those stakeholders spoke at the last CIDLAC meeting, the iBank meeting, or the TEPRA hearing held in 2019. And you'll notice many of them are here again today. One of our initial outreach meetings early in 2019 was to the California Governor's Office and the Treasurer's Office. These early conversations on the need for tax-exempt debt were met with excitement given the importance of increased mobility in the state, as well as our commitment to deliver a fully electric high-speed train. In April 2019, I sat down together with Deputy Cabinet Secretary Mark Tollefson from the Governor's Office and Deputy Treasurer Giovanna Aji to discuss the project in more detail and to outline the benefits for the state. The conversation quickly turned to affordable housing and the acute need for more of these types of developments throughout California. It was around this time that both the Governor and Treasurer's offices asked us to consider splitting our tax exempt request over two calendar years to balance everyone's needs. Therefore, we are back in front of this committee for the second time today. Treasurer Ma has been very clear from day one that the future development of affordable housing is critical to the state and is a primary goal of the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee. And that is why we have met your condition of preparing an economic development plan to show that this project isn't just about transportation infrastructure. That report was completed and submitted to CIDLAC staff in mid-December and will be presented to you shortly by our consultant, Sanjay Varshney. I want to also applaud Governor Newsom for announcing his vision to invest over the next five years approximately $17 billion to bolster housing production. This, event, this investment allows for both transportation needs and affordable housing needs to be prioritized simultaneously by the state. I'd also like to address why this tax exempt allocation is so crucial to this project. The reason private activity bonds are part of our capital structure is the three to four year ridership ramp up period involved in these types of projects. With a reduced rate on our debt, the project can successfully incur the upfront operational costs as we focus on shifting people out of their cars and onto our train. Private activity bonds are used for projects when private entities invest in transportation infrastructure and thereby create significant public benefits. This project has significant economic and environmental benefits in addition to building a new transportation network for the state. This is why it is a perfect candidate for a volume cap. Now before I turn it over to Sanjay, I want to be clear to the Board of Select that this project will not only be a significant driver for the creation of affordable housing in the Victor Valley area, we will be a direct contributor which is why you see so many members of, from the cities and counties in the project location here today. The community Virgin Trains will be located within, recognizes the economic impact the project will have on job creation, mobility, and most importantly, the development of housing. This project will bring thousands of much needed affordable housing units to the area, but it will also bring a $5 billion infrastructure project to the region and the project will bring tens of thousands of construction jobs and lead to hundreds of permanent jobs as well. For example, we have committed to build our vehicle maintenance facility in California because of this state's leadership in providing tax exempt volume cap. This vehicle maintenance facility alone will employ approximately 100 highly skilled workers earning an average salary of $70,000 each. Treasurer Ma and her team came to Orlando in South Florida to see the Florida system as part of their due diligence process. What I believe they saw firsthand was the way Virgin Trains' system has transformed the communities it services in Florida. They saw the significant development that has occurred around the stations and the revitalization of those neighborhoods. Several other delegations of city and county leaders throughout Southern California have come to Florida and have seen the system in housing developments in Florida firsthand. We want to replicate this throughout the country. We started in Florida because we own the rail infrastructure there. But we see this system out west as the logical and natural next step for our company's growth. The corridor between Southern California and Las Vegas is a great corridor. A significant number of people travel the corridor regularly, approximately 56 million trips, predominantly by car on a very congested roadway, making passenger rail a perfect alternative for travelers in the region. Our system will complement and add value to the north-south 
transportation infrastructure investments being made by California. I, addressing the east-west connectivity issues in a way that meets California's growth and transportation goals. It creates housing, it's environmentally friendly, and eliminates congestion on a heavily traveled corridor. We appreciate your consideration of our $300 million allocation request. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Varshney to walk through the economic development study that we prepared. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Treasurer and members of the board and uh, staff here present. Um, my name is Sanjay Varshney. I'm from Varshney Associates. Uh, uh, I want to thank the board for the <coughs> opportunity to present the findings of the economic study that we did on behalf of uh, Virgin Trains. Uh, we were retained by uh, VT USA to conduct a study and take a look at all the economic and other ancillary impacts that might take place in the Victor Valley region comprising Victorville and Apple Valley, uh, also referred to as the High Desert, and um, to uh, take a look at what could be uh, possible on the 300 acres of land that actually that is right now currently owned by VTUSA. So the SIPLAC uh, $600 million allocation, given the fact that um, the VTUSA has the ability to market four times as many bonds, uh, would have a four times multiplier effect on the investment that's gonna be made. So a 600 million investment obviously would translate into a $2.4 billion uh, investment into the, in, uh, into the area. And the question is, uh, what kind of impact can we see over time, over the, let's say the next several years, uh, especially the next 10 years? So um, I wanna walk you through um, some of the, the key findings of our report. And, um, and then um, see if you have any questions. Um, the first uh, major finding, uh, given the $2.4 billion investment that would take place in the Victor Valley region, is, is what could happen to housing, for example. And clearly a lot of comments have already been made about affordable housing uh, and multifamily housing. And with this project, uh, we expect to see uh, immediately 1,690 units that could go in uh, fairly quickly on about 72 acres of, uh, of land that's owned by VTUSA, which is in very, uh, it's a very short distance uh, from Virgin Train Station that's, uh, that's going in there. And then there's a further potential for another 1,800 units on the remaining 228 acres uh, that are owned by VTUSA in the next several years. Uh, environmental impacts uh, clearly are, are, uh, are there, you know, with the removal of 100,000 plus metric tons of carbon emissions <coughs> annually, uh, it's going to remove uh, roughly 3 million cars from the road. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, and then of course it offers a, uh, an alternative to I-15. So environmental impacts are huge. And if you look at just the economic impacts directly or indirectly or induced, uh, we expect uh, more than 20,000 construction jobs that would be created as a result of the project. And of course, uh, these, are, these are usually one-time kind of jobs, um, but we do expect recurring jobs that would be about 600 annually. <coughs> so over the next 10 years, one could expect roughly 6,000 permanent jobs to be created because of the project. In terms of total output, um, that would uh, basically result from the project, it would be roughly $2.66 billion. Uh, generating roughly 360 million in federal, state, and local taxes. And overall, if you ask me, what, how would I summarize the impact of the train station and the operation of the uh, rail uh, between uh, uh, the uh, Victorville area as well and, and the Apple Valley area as, as well as uh, Las Vegas, I would say that the project would serve as a catalyst. Uh, that's gonna spur a lot more economic development just by the nature of, of, of the activity that's going to take place from the $2.4 billion uh, investment that's going to be made. Um, just to uh, give you a, a, an overall sense on what the area currently looks like in terms of demographics, and I think some of the comments have already made, been made, um, and I echo some of those comments. In general, uh, the, the uh, Victor Valley region has seen a lot of growth in recent years. And if you ask why, the reason is that given that 
less than probably half of the total population of California uh, resides in the greater LA basin. Increasingly, Los Angeles has become a very uh, expensive area to live in and work in. And the, the, the loss of affordability has forced individuals and families to move out and seek uh, less expensive areas where they can find housing. And so um, you, if you look at, just like I said, if you look at the demographics, in general, the population of uh, the Victor Valley area is younger in age. They tend to be, um, uh, they have lower household incomes. So uh, obviously poverty levels are higher, unemployment rates are higher, uh, given that jobs are scarce. To a large extent, people are still commuting long distances to go back to the metro Los Angeles area for work. Um, but the reason why we've seen a lot more growth, like I said, in the, in the, uh, in the high desert area is because people have been pushed out from Los Angeles and, and they're seeking uh, more affordable areas. So uh, housing obviously is a great need in that area. And affordable housing has an even greater need in that area. Uh, there's a lot of benefits one could envision with any major investment uh, that comes to close that comes close to let's say 2.4 billion dollars. So um, uh, you can see, for example, on this slide, you know we have listed a lot of economic benefits and even non-economic benefits. Uh, many of them quantitative, some of them qualitative. Uh, and rather than spend a lot of time on this slide, I thought I would zero in on the housing uh, because that's been the the major question today so far that I've heard. And so um, what would this project do for housing? So um, our study was done in collaboration, not only with uh, Virgin Trains, but with also with the local governments in both Victorville and Apple Valley, um, as well as uh, the local real estate folks that we saw in that region and the developers that we could talk to. And um, the data that we were able to get our hands on. Um, so um, if you look at the regional uh, housing needs assessment, for Victorville and, and Apple Valley, uh, the demand for the next uh, ten, uh, approximately 10 years um, is 8,134 housing units needed in Victorville and roughly 4,274 units needed in Apple Valley. So that's, what, that's the demand that's being projected for housing given the current population and the population trends and the growth. The number of units that are currently being built and based on those we extrapolated as to what we think is going to get built by 2029, given the current level of construction activity we see in the area. Uh, we think in the next several years, um, roughly 2,880 units will be built in Victorville and 2,780 units will be built in Apple Valley. So if you look at the number of units demanded and the number of units getting built, there's a, there's a huge divergence there. So the, the number of units coming online, the supply, is about a little bit more than a third of the total number of units uh, that are really needed over the next several years. Uh, currently, there are uh, 2,077 lots uh, available in Victorville and 2,777 lots in, uh, available in Apple Valley that would be considered to be available and shovel ready. Um, and given um, the project, the, the train station project, uh, and given the number of jobs we expect uh, to be created, uh, we are projecting that the, the project can actually support roughly 7,490 multifamily housing units, um, uh, uh, both between uh, Victorville and Apple Valley. So in, in other words, uh, this project can support a large number of multifamily units. Uh, and that would be, um, I think, something that would go towards meeting the demand um, uh, in, in the region uh, over the next 10 years, which is, which is a very large number, which is currently not being met. Um, this next slide uh, talks about what would happen in the future beyond 2029 if, let's say, the Palmdale extension goes in, and, and, uh, and, and what would happen to the region in terms of both the economics and the demographics. So um, our thinking is that once the Palmdale extension goes in, if I had to do a very conservative estimate of what it would do to the region from a population standpoint uh, and an economic standpoint, I think it's going to basically make the place even more vibrant because right now, uh, you know, it's, it's basically transforming itself to be a regional population center. It's, still, it's not an economic center yet because, like I said, many of the folks are still going to the, the metro LA region for jobs. 
but there's a potential of transforming this local hub to becoming more of a national hub because this could also be the gateway for tourism, where tourists are coming into LA and they would then they want to go to Las Vegas, for example, uh, or, or someplace else from there. So there is this expectation that uh, the population is going to grow in the Victor Valley um, uh, region, uh, much more so, uh, get, it's going to get accelerated because of the project, the train station project. And, and that's going to create more economic activity over the next several years. And if the population, by conservative estimates, let's say grows by another 10% in the region, which is likely to do because we're already seeing a lot in migration where uh, folks are moving away from the coast and they're going towards more inland areas, which are much more affordable, uh, including what's happening in Sacramento, for example, what's happening from the Bay Area coming into, into Sacramento, uh, we expect then uh, additional demand for another 5,000 units to come online or and above uh, the regional housing needs assessment that we have already basically gone through in an earlier slide. So, so the, the demand for housing is going to keep growing in this region regardless. Whether there's a project or no project or a project, right? There, there is going to be high demand. Uh, when we talked to several folks out there, uh, we were also pointed towards uh, what is considered to be the Desert Gateway Project. Um, and we actually did a site visit of this one as well. Uh, it's roughly more than 10,000 acres uh, piece of land. Uh, which was envisioned a while ago, um, completely shovel ready, uh, where they were envisioning uh, a mixed use center uh, to basically uh, have a kind of a transit system linking uh, all the centers together, a multimodal transportation network with uh, roadways, bikeways, trails, a lot of parks, green spaces. Um, and this project, even though it's shovel ready, uh, has really not uh, come to fruition as had been originally envisioned. Uh, and uh, I think the train project could serve as a great catalyst uh, for this project to basically go fully online. And if the Palmdale extension goes in, uh, the, the Desert Gateway um, area um, can, can be transformed completely, both uh, population-wise as well as uh, from an economic standpoint. So I think the Desert Gateway plan, like I said, which is, which is shovel-ready, had been envisioned has really not come to fruition the way it was envisioned, can come to fruition because of the, of the train station acting as a, as a catalyst. Uh, the second uh, area that we visited was the North Apple Valley Industrial Center, uh, which is a large industrial center of more than 6,600 acres. Currently has some really big anchor stores in there. It's a, there's, a, there's a big Walmart in there, there's a big lots, uh, there's a large training center, there's a large logistics center. Uh, this industrial area is within two miles of the train station. So once again, if you ask what could happen to this area uh, logistically and otherwise, uh, my expectation would be that this is gonna transform itself even more aggressively uh, into a more vibrant economic center uh, because of all the economic activity that's gonna happen with the train station. So there is gonna be more growth in this, in this area as well. Um, the vision uh, for uh, the train station and what it could do to housing and to economic development in the area, uh, I think can borrow a little bit from uh, what's already happened in Florida. So uh, they have built roughly 800 units, for example, in, in very close proximity to the, to the train station. Uh, and, and that has really spurred a lot of economic activity. And I think the, the same thing can be envisioned uh, to, to happen in, um, in the Victor Valley region. Uh, this is a, 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 a close-up of the map of the actual train station area as to what it, what, uh, it looks like and what it looks like in the future. Uh, this is all the parcels around the train station. And as you can see, there are four parcels that are owned by VTUSA, which can immediately be put to use for, for multifamily housing units, uh, totaling for 1,690 units. Uh, we talked to the town folks and the planning folks, uh, and uh, um, they obviously uh, gave us a full timeline as to how uh, and what and when things can be done to basically make some of these things a reality. This is just a rendering, a rough uh, rendering of uh, what the uh, housing uh, would look like close to the, the train station. Um, we, we also asked the question, if uh, you take all the shovel-ready projects that are out there, and if let's say multifamily housing has to be built quickly, uh, are there builders already in the region that will step up uh, to the table and, and, and engage? And so this is, these are, these are all the names that surfaced uh, and came to, uh, came to us. 
So um, if um, uh, you know if if, um, if uh, these builders were engaged, uh, I think uh, the multifamily housing units could go in fairly quickly. Uh, but there's a timeline, obviously, we included um, in our more detailed deck that we gave to the to the board earlier, uh, which shows, for example, how the the zoning and the rezoning and some of the the master plan and uh, some of the other essentials would need to be done over the next two, three, four years. Uh, that timeline goes up to 2027. And um, in short, I guess uh, that's uh, something that you can take a look at to see what, what, you know, what would be needed to, to make uh, these things a reality. But overall, if I had to summarize uh, the entire project, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the significant investment of dollars will result in a large amount of economic impact, which typically most projects do, like of this of similar nature. But I think in, in, in this this project is a little bit more unique because it has the ability to have a multiplier of four because of uh, the private public uh, partnership, and uh, uh, because of the nature of the demographics of uh, the Victor Valley region and how it draws from the population of the, the metro LA area, there's a huge potential for further growth and a lot of economic impact that can take place in the next several years. So uh, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Any questions from board members? I, I, I do. Uh, yes. From staff, maybe first, can you, uh, are there additional materials that were provided beyond this presentation? And if so, uh, I'd be curious to hear how you think this meets the condition of the how to get there. And I don't, I'll, I'll hold my promise that first, do you, you guys feel this meets the condition of how they would like it? To me, this looks like an economic impact report, a lot of possibility, but I didn't see much how they're going to get there on the housing side. And I'm happy to elaborate on what I would expect to see in a how. So I'm more curious if they provide anything additional to you that makes you feel it satisfies that condition. Well, I, I can address the uh, economic development plan. They, they did provide a much larger version of this, which is posted on our website. Yeah. Yeah, it's posted on the website, the entire um, plan. Um, and I think it goes into a whole lot more detail about what, where, and what it went, um, as you had asked it to uh, back in September. Uh, I think a lot of that detail is in the report. I, I was satisfied that it was there. I mean, I'll take a further look at that. It's just my concern was, you know, was told that the timeline that was referenced would be addressed in this presentation. I don't see anything addressing it in this presentation that accelerates that timeline that was previously proposed. So what I'd expect to see in a how, right, is the cities are going to take action, uh, zoning actions, expediting permitting actions, uh, density bonuses will be pursued, et cetera, et cetera. Are those in the further plan? To that, yes. I mean, not, maybe not to... You don't even, the how was okay. not addressed yeah. in yeah. Maybe not It was a lot about, I, you know, not to throw words back, but a lot of, we think this could happen. Right. We expect that this will create interest. And obviously what I've seen in the, um, of course, my career, right, is without, without city partners, which I know there are here, but I was hoping to hear a little bit more about what the cities are going to do to help facilitate that action, to help condition that environment for developers to come. Well, and so I'm curious if that. I do think that there's a uh, lot more. For there, for is, there, there is a lot more detail, and I think that it's probably very important for the members to actually see and, and digest that information in some detail. Yeah, I was not aware that it was available on your website until this is a presentation of the first time. So, so, um, so similar to high speed rail, which I was very active with in the Central Valley, where all the elected officials, the chambers, um, the other stakeholders got together and said, hey, we want it here uh, because of their great need. That's why it's being built in the Central Valley. Uh, similarly, I've been down to uh, the high desert region a number of times now, met with elected officials, met with the city managers, um, the other financing economic development folks, and they are all uh, uniform in their desire um, to have um, this project there, the economic development, the, the housing um, there, which is not easy in many regions in San Francisco and the Bay, uh, Bay Area, you know, Los Angeles, where um, many of these projects are controversial uh, and you don't find everybody um, on the same page in terms of you know supporting and strongly supporting the project. So I don't know if you're asking for the cities, Victorville, Apple Valley to put together like, um, you know, there's at least a dozen affordable housing developers out there that have been waiting 
for some sort of um, economic catalyst. And yeah, um, I mean, I asked for that last time, right, in September. Well, September. Okay, so, so that's what I was hoping would be presented today, is City X has taken this action in the subsequent months to condition these sites by right for development, or to enact an ordinance, or to streamline the development. So the, when those applicants come in, they'll be processing anything. Those would be nice things to enhance such a proposal of the how to get there, rather than the we hope that will generate this sort of economic. Okay, well, so I'll take a look. I mean, I'm just offering those comments just for continuity purposes. Uh, if you guys have looked at the plans and you feel like it meets that, I think the presentation was much more of an impact rather than the how, so if you feel the additional materials uh, suffice for meeting that condition, I certainly trust the staff's record. And we'll have that posted shortly on our site. Okay, it hasn't been available. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Then you have a nope. presentation? Sounds like, no, I was just going to, felt like you guys answered the question, so. Okay. Um, any? I just have a technical question, Madam Chair. In terms of the federal approval, Mr. Clark, that was, that's a condition of the approval of the funding. That <coughs> don't, like, could you just say that one more time? Um, we had requested a, a letter from the uh, Federal Railroad Administration saying that they were um, satisfied that uh, the current NEPA study that was presented in connection with the project is uh, sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, we received a letter that said that they were um, that they were still looking at it, and that um, and that at this time they have not um, at this time that they have not uncovered anything that would lead them to believe that uh, that the study was not sufficient but that's not exactly the language that we were looking for we're looking for something more affirmative um, and so um, there's some question in, in, in our mind as to whether the second condition has actually been met Okay, and so until that condition has been met to your satisfaction, the funding, the allocation will actually happen? They, they wouldn't be able to issue until, until the conditions have been met. Okay. So moving on from Virgin Trains, um, you know, the letter says that uh, they don't anticipate, but the final report, what is, are they working on it, and what is the process at the federal level? I mean, you're... Yeah, no, better than I'm I. <laughs> what? I'm gonna pull up the letter because um, I gave staff my nope. original. So, um, <coughs> Ms. Miller, if you if you look at the second sentence of the middle paragraph, um, which says at this time, based on the information we reviewed to date, FRA has not identified new significant environmental impacts that would trigger a supplemental EIS. You know, the key for us is if a supplemental EIS is needed, that's what kind of triggers that multi-year process. And so um, until they, you know, issue the record of decision, there's, you know, always a chance that as you go through the process, something pops up, right? So they, um, we have already purchased the land, so we're not changing the site. Um, you know, we've got the alignment. You know, there was a lot of talk about whether the old alignment like uh, clip the Mojave Desert. We've actually brought it out of the Mojave Desert. So we've done everything we've needed to do to actually have less impact as opposed to more. And so everything that we have gone through with FRA has led them to say there is no multi-year environmental process that is going to get triggered. And that for us is the is the key threshold as to whether or not you can issue bonds or not. You know, people are, well, the private sector will not purchase bonds if you know, there was a chance that a two-year environment, a multi-year environmental process was going to get kicked off. I appreciate that. And, and as you know, we're very supportive of this project. But I guess my question isn't for you. The question is, how are you going to meet the conditions of the affirmative federal approval ahead of issuing the debt? Understood. That is my question. How? Oh, so so are, are, are we happening? expecting a report from them? The so, 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 yeah, so, the, so the final, the, so I think there's two thresholds to that. Um, there's, there's threshold one, which is 
the the letter continuing to state affirm, affirmatively that a supplemental EIS is not needed. That would, in our opinion, having spoken to the underwriters, that gives us the ability to sell the bonds. Um, what would be the final outside document that shows up is the record of decision. But because a record of decision was issued for this project back in 2011, um, it is not focused on whether or not there's the constructability of the project is allowed. It's more of if there going to be other, any other mitigation. And so for the investors, what they want to know is you can actually construct the project, not necessarily focused on you know, what may be some additional mitigation that would be added. So for us, it's being in that posture of no supplemental EIS is needed. That allows us to actually go to market. So I, I did bring up my bonds. This is like a typical bond sale, Correct. general obligation, and all of these disclosures uh, and reports have to be in these bonds. Uh, and the investors have to feel confident that um, there aren't going to be um, additional environmental impacts um, that are going to delay the project, right? Um, so I guess the question is, um, you got a letter. I think the letter is positive. Um, are we go are we to expect? A report, a final report, or is that all we're going to get from the federal government? Um, I think we will incrementally get continued certainty that as long as we're not changing the project, there'd be no supplemental <coughs> environmental process that would kick off. And so, um, when does the Federal Railroad Administration like do they ever like sign off on a report? They would. That's that record of decision that they would eventually sign off. And they signed off in 2011 Correct. on the Desert Express project. Correct. And are there any significant changes from 2011 that so so have been made to so your there project? would be three significant changes. One would have been the station location in the Victor Valley, going okay. from one side of I-15 to the other end of I-15. Okay. The other one was the route um, contemplated buying a lot of private parcels because it was going to be a right of way outside of the I-15 corridor. We brought it into the I-15 corridor. Okay. And then there was discussion about the alignment uh, from the previous owners potentially um, intruding into the Mojave Desert. Okay. There was a whole complicated issue. And when we purchased the project, we realized that um, although there was a path to get that done, if we could design the project where we didn't have to do that, it was in the best interest of everyone from an environmental standpoint. So the project has actually become less impactful as opposed to more impactful. Right. Okay, so when would we expect their final sign-off? I would say in the summer that they would issue a record of decision. That would be kind of their final action that they would take. This summer? This summer. When do you expect to issue the bonds? Um, if our underwriters feel that we could go to market because there is no supplemental environmental work doing it, um, going on and it's just an administrative process to get to the record of decision, then we'd obviously rely on the underwriter's opinion on that. Except that you haven't met the requirements that we set forth. <coughs> I, I, I feel like we're not saying... I, I understand. Yeah, no, okay. I understand what I, you're I mean, saying. I appreciate Correct. it and I, I want to get there. I just don't... Yeah, and I think we for, need some assurance, right? Correct, and I think for us, um, the assurance would be. I, so let me back up. I I believe from the initial conversations, the concern was, we would not issue bonds at a point in the project where certainty on the environmental process being completed was there, and that big uncertainty was whether or not a supplemental EIS was needed, because that would start a multi-year process um, that would occur. And from our perspective, getting to the decision point where no supplemental EIS is needed, for us, is the clarity on the environmental process that investors would need. Since in 2011, they signed off on a more complicated Correct. process, and you've made it easier. Correct. When, when do you expect a letter uh, saying there, there should be no supplemental. Um, we will we'll request that letter like every month, just as an increment. You know that's. But you, you don't. So you don't know though. I mean, it's, look, uh, the no, 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 so, no, 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 no. So, Tony, I think the, I, I think the way the federal government would work on this is as long as we don't change the alignment of the project or change the station location, it wouldn't trigger a supplemental, right? So. So what they're saying is what you have submitted to date and what we've reviewed doesn't trigger a supplemental. 
if tomorrow we woke up and said, you know, we're changing the station location, that would obviously potentially change that decision. But the fact that we put the land under contract, you know, we're, we've kind of locked into that station right. location. Um, and so for us, we've made the commitments to show that the design of the project that's been submitted to FRA is the project that we, that we will build. So I guess, um, like this summer, is it because they take a long time? They're waiting for something, because or they're waiting for you to sell the bonds. No, no, no. no. So, so, so I think it's just the the just the process of reviewing all the documents, getting other federal agencies to concur on everything. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a document that is signed off on by Federal Highways and Calsta, Nevada DOT, you know, and others. So it's just it's it's just aggregating the document together. Mm -hmm. But that document and that process, again, doesn't go to the constructability of the project. It goes to whether or not any you know, additional mitigation or mitigation that was proposed in 2011 is no longer valid. Mm -hmm. well, but it, it, it could, there could be things that come up that interfere with moving forward. If we change the alignment or the station location. No, I mean, I mean if, 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 if we change the design of the project. Some supplemental. Correct. If we change. comes on and makes you do something, some mitigation. Correct. So, um, let's say, I mean, I don't know if you can issue bonds without, you know, checking off all that, but let's say you issue the bonds. Um, does that give the federal government certainty that you're not going to change the route or any other alignment? Um, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's like they signed off in 2011. This seems like it's um, easier uh, process. They still have to put together the paperwork, but I assume back then they did all that initially. I'm not sure whether they have to go redo every single thing because they don't keep any paperwork. Nothing's, uh, you know, on file, and so therefore they're going to go through the whole process again and collect all the same things or, you know, just update all the documents or what. I just don't understand. Yeah, so um, we would disclose in, in detail um, the project that would be constructed because that project that would be constructed would also have a construction cost attached to it. Right? So when they're purchasing the bonds, um, they're not just looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, let me know what you're going to build. They want to know that what we're going to build is actually coming in at a cost right. that can be achieved between the combination of debt and equity. So you're kind of locked into that project scope um, once you go out to market. And so what if, after you go to market, the federal government doesn't give you the positive sign-off? I'm just saying worst case scenario, right? We wouldn't go to market until we knew that we were at the point where from that point forward it was more of an administrative process than a, a decision as to whether or not a supplemental EIS was needed. Okay. So, so you're really focused on the supplemental. Correct. And not not the sign off on the report. On the record, correct. Oh. This, I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing the letter, and it, it doesn't read to me like you have affirmative approval from the federal government, like we discussed previously. No. So I, I understand, but I also, you know, we, the federal government can change its mind fairly quickly, as we've seen, and I, I think we need some assurity of before, before these bonds, in fact, go to market, I think both for the the integrity of the project and the folks and the jobs relying on it, and um, and the, the precious bond cap that we're talking about. Fair I enough. I think these are that's a really important step in terms of the financing. And all the bond documents before they go out have to be signed off by not only the treasurer's office but by iBank as well. And so, you know, that is the the check off to make sure that we've actually met that condition. Right, and that's what you're. I, I'm not seeing here today as part of your checkoff. Correct, but we're not going, we, we don't have bond documents ready to, you know, present to the treasurer's office and I bank either. Right, but this was sort of the last check and balance of the financing in the, in the timeline of your project. Correct. So I, so I guess the question, Madam Chair, is if we wait and see what the letter from the federal government says next week. Um, I, 
for next month. I yeah, think, I, but that's sort of my question. As yeah, and I think, in all honesty, I think we'll get the the same letter because if there are like they're going to protect themselves if if we change the project. But what I'm telling you today is like what our goal is to get out into the market and sell the bonds, not to not to change the project in a way that would trigger a supplemental EIS. Thanks. The, the, the sentence that's a little concerning is that last sentence of the second paragraph where it says, however, FRA will continue to work with our federal and state agency partners and pursue the analysis necessary to inform whether additional environmental review is necessary. And that just, I, I, I agree with Ms. Miller that the big concern here is not the project itself. It's that we allocate these bonds, we issue the bonds somehow, and then the project fails. And then we, Understood. We, it's, it's an opportunity cost. To and, and I think, you know, I think we'll get more and more clarity as the months go by, right? So, uh, you know, maybe I was quick to answer and saying we get the same letter. I think um, that letter will get uh, more, more crisp. Um, but I believe from our perspective as well, we're gonna want that before we go out to the market anyway. So I think there's, there's the check and balance there is the fact that we would not be able to go to market and sell the bonds if that clarity wasn't there on a supplemental EIS. I also think it, if I could, in, in, in all fairness, and as somebody who spent a lot of time working for the federal government, that there is no letter that you're ever gonna get that isn't gonna have a certain amount of squishiness in it. So, I mean, the, it's almost a question of what level of, of, of it are you comfortable with? Because there's always going to be a sentence or a paragraph or something that says, you know, this is to make sure that we cover all of our bases so that uh, nothing that happens in the future is going to come back to haunt us. But the second letter, I thought it was your recommendation that this letter didn't need. Yeah, and, I, and, 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 and for me, it's the first sentence mm -hmm. of the first paragraph that's the most troubling to me in the sense that they're saying that, um, um, that um, yeah, that they're continuing to analyze whether the current project modifications uh, will trigger the need for additional. I would say I can understand, you know, future changes triggering it. My problem is, you know, it says here that they're looking at the current project, and that's what kind of threw me. If, they, if that line could change, then I'm, I'm happy. So what? Do you think that's possible? Um, we got this letter this morning from them, and so, um, <laughs> you know, they, they knew today was the day, and of course they used every minute of every hour of every day to, to get the letter. So. <laughs> Um, obviously, we will go back and have that conversation, but um, I wasn't able to have that conversation between getting the letter and the and the speech. That's understandable. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we um, listen to public comment first? Okay. Let us think about. Public comment. Oh. Public comment. State treasurer, committee members, Robbie Hunter. Uh, State Building Construction Trades Council. Can we turn off this uh, projector? <laughs> I don't like getting the wrong button. There you go. There you go. Never know. Um, Thank you. We're here to speak in support of the application uh, for the issuance of the bonds for this project. Um, we represent 450,000 construction workers, 65,000 apprentices. Uh, fifth, one in five of those apprentices are under the re-entry program of the foster care system of California. That's 15,000 projects. The, the, the uh, Virgin Train, I almost said Virgin Airline, Virgin Train <laughs> has made a commitment uh, to pay fair wages to employ apprentices for the, the, the completion of this project. This project will alleviate the 15, which is really a parking lot on weekends. It does everything that California, you've heard it numerous times, so I won't speak about those points, uh, but the jobs that will be driven and the opportunity uh, for the high desert for working people with this project, uh, we are in absolute support of it. We don't think taxpayer supported uh, bonds could be better spent than they are here, both for infrastructure, quality of life, and assurances that the workers who work on this project um, can have a good way to support their families. Um, we request and ask 
ask for the support of uh, the assurance of the bonds. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I was going to say good morning, but it's afternoon. Chair <laughs> <laughs> Mom, nice to see you again. It's a pleasure. And uh, committee members, I'm here on behalf of Transportation California. We are a long um, uh, a, a coalition of long standing supporting transportation funding and mobility funding and mobility options. And we're here to encourage you to go ahead and uh, approve the allocation for the request. Uh, we did submit a letter. The letter is noted in the staff report uh, in support of this uh, allocation. So, because I'm losing my voice, I'll stop at that point and urge your approval today. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Chairman Ma and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Chris Smith. I'm here on behalf of the Associated General Contractors in California. We represent about a thousand uh, general specialty uh, and subcontractors throughout the state of California, both the union and, and open shop members. Uh, and we're here to ask to the committee approve uh, the application before you regarding Virgin Trains. Um, as the uh, governor has outlined, um, the state must develop solutions to combat climate change while addressing the housing crisis, while improving our infrastructure without compromising uh, our economic competitiveness. And this project uh, does uh, uh, meet all those goals. Um, we know that Californians are driving more uh, and they're forced to make longer commutes, um, which is uh, due to the lack of proximity between housing and job centers. Um, these long distances combined with idle car times makes it more difficult to achieve our climate goals um, and, and threatened uh, uh, potentially to uh, address some of our uh, local transportation funding. Um, this project provides an effective alternative, uh, allowing us an opportunity uh, to take millions of cars off the road and continue forward to meet our state goals. Um, the governor also stated in his budget uh, that California must embrace a transportation system that is flexible and open to the potential for better travel options in order to meet the state's growing population needs. We've seen businesses located uh, in the state's most accessible and connected job hubs have advantages in the number of skilled workers that can reach them. And, and again, this project uh, is able to help deliver on the state's goals, uh, connecting major urban centers together amplifying mobility, increasing economic competitiveness, and easing congestion. Uh, and that's just the start. Um, as state invests in projects like this, um, California has a better opportunity in being a leader in building better connected regions. And so on behalf of our members, um, I would urge you to uh, uh, move this up and continue to support this project. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to come here in support of the Express West project. My name is Carol Church. I'm the Director of Operations for Southern California Partnership for Jobs. Southern California Partnership for Jobs is a nonprofit organization that represents 2,750 contractors who employs over 90,000 union folks in Southern California. On behalf of the District Council laborers, operating engineers, and the carpenters, Southern California <laughs> works with elected officials and educates the public on the continuing need for infrastructure funding, creating not only good paying jobs, but also construction careers within our communities. Express West as a project at its peak will create over 18,000 jobs. I encourage you to approve the recommendation of the use of the tax exempt bonds for Virgin Trans USA's Express West project. We also sent a letter of support in 2019 and we have another one at your desk as well as for 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Brian Stuker from Los Angeles County. I'm here on behalf of the chair of our board, Catherine Barger, who wanted to be here today, but she couldn't, so she has to read a brief letter. Uh, dear Chairman Ma, I am not able to attend today's hearing in person, but I write this letter to express my strong support for the allocation request before you, which will help realize a high-speed rail service between Las Vegas and Southern California. This is, an ex this is an exciting project that will bring a fast, convenient, and reliable alternative to automobile congestion along the I-15, improve air quality, and create nearly 20,000 quality construction jobs in an area of the state with high unemployment. Virgin Train's proposal will also bolster local economies and quality of life, spurring smart development near stations like they have done in Florida. This transit-oriented development is much needed 
as our state faces significant housing challenges. I view Virgin Trains' proposed project as a critical first phase in an eventual Vegas to Los Angeles high-speed rail service that has the potential to ultimately unlock blended and integrated service scenarios throughout the region. This is a huge opportunity to transform the way we approach inner city and interstate travel along a significantly constrained corridor, and it represents a step towards realizing the state rail plan. As evidenced by their operations in Florida, Virgin Trains has demonstrated their ability to deliver on their vision and generate public benefits. This is a bold step toward realizing a reimagined transportation system in California, improved air quality, regional economic expansion, and increased housing stock. I thank you and members of your committee for your time and consideration and urge your support for this application. Sincerely, Catherine Berger. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Treasurer and members. Uh, Tyler Munzing on behalf of the American Council of Engineering Companies representing over 25,000 civil engineers, uh, geologists, and land surveyors and other design professionals in the state. Um, not to belabor the point, but for all the reasons as articulated by the previous speakers, we're also in strong support and uh, recommend your approval of this allocation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthew Gaines. I'm the political director for the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 12. <coughs> we represent 19,000 construction workers, mostly crane bulldozer operators surveyors, inspectors that, that would be impacted by this project. But I also wear a second hat. I'm, I'm a trustee for the Keppel Union Elementary School District, and we are sandwiched between Victorville and Palmdale. Okay, so either phase of this project affects us. And, and the way it affects us is, according to the Google, the federal poverty level for a two-person household is $16,910. 91% of my families qualify or free and reduce lunch at this level. <coughs> this project brings forward the opportunity for families in this whole region. You know, we talked about big economic impacts. If, if I was the 10th person to make 100%, these nine chairs represent the people that make less than $16,000 a year in my community. And I think that looking at that as an overall impact for the health of the state, it is a, a big piece to look into, aside from the skilled and trained workforce and the piece that Mr. Hunter brought up about bringing in people that were formerly incarcerated or have you know, no, no path to anything else in life except this good paying job. So I, I would really ask that you think about that and, and look at this as a region, uh, a, a regional impact that people won't have to commute. You know, as we look at trying to reach climate change goals, these, these are jobs that people wouldn't have to get in the car and drive to, or at least drive a very short distance. So with that in mind, I, I hope you consider <coughs> supporting this. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be brief, as I'm taking a cup of coffee, starting to look that second way out. Um, my name is Steve Agor, and I'm a registered civil engineer here in California, and I work for Skanska. We are the selected CMGC contractor for the Express West project. Uh, we currently employ over 450 salaried employees and over 1,100 craft employees on our projects. Many of those craft employees are actually second, third, and fourth generation craft employees at Skanska. Celebrate our 100 years of construction in California last year. So uh, we are in the community of San Bernardino, Riverside, and uh, continue to do so. We're happy to support the project. Um, quickly, also, uh, not to repeat everything that everybody said, I'm also an advisory board member to Mobility 21. Uh, they have uh, provided a letter of support, which I'll also run hard copy for you here today. Thank you. Oops. Oh, Any other speakers? So, Madam Chair, yeah. thinking, um, I'd like to amend the staff recommendation. Okay. Um, there are two areas that I think um, we need more input. Number one, I think with respect to the letter, we just got it this morning. And so I um, am not sure, I, I don't know that any of us are experts on Fed speak, but I think I would like for staff to be able to contact the FRA directly and get some input as to what they think this means before uh, we make a decision. It also concerns me that um, 
members of committee have not had access to the full economic development plan to be able to look at that before a vote. So I, I would like to recommend that we um, that we postpone a vote on this project until the February board meeting. You give us a chance to talk to the FRA and you give the board a chance to read the uh, economic development plan. Okay, can I also ask a question for the underwriters? <coughs> Marky Baxter. Hey, Morgan Stanley. Hi, Marky. Um, you know, so we understand time is of the essence for all these projects. Time is money. We, um, everybody is operating on a schedule. Um, when you issue bonds, uh, knowing that I, I do issue bonds with all you guys, that it requires um, a lot of oversight and approvals from bond council, for example. Um, what is bond council going to look for, or you as the underwriters, in terms of you know the federal railroad support? Right. Good question. Um, so, what we really are looking for is what investors want to see, and based on our very quick review, because we also saw the letter just this morning, um, we think that investors would be willing to invest, but might require the money to be held um, in a sort of trust or escrow, escrow. until the um, until a more definitive letter or record of decision is received. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I, and just that's, yep. and that answer. I think that's the last thing we want. Yeah, I think we want the project to be built, but we don't want to issue the bonds and then not have the ability to use them. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, I mean, right now, you know, <coughs> let's say the project didn't. Go forward, we could reuse the bonds as well. So um, it's not like it's a you know decision we have to make today. Um, but I do hear from my fellow board members, our executive director, and uh, folks that we need a little more certainty from the federal government. Um, perhaps we need to uh, do our own due diligence. Um, plus, uh, the board members um, have just seen the letter as well as the environmental report. Yeah. Um, and so I would, I think, I think the motion would be to postpone the decision um, for another month. Sure. Okay. Bond council. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize no, bond council okay. here too. Treasurer Bond, uh, uh, members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, ju I just want to make a couple. One to respond to your question about what does bond council need. Uh, my understanding is that, fr from my perspective. Uh, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Yeah. This keeps getting louder. Right. What is this? It's some hold music. Is it hold? Yeah, they put us on hold. <laughs> <laughs> as low as it goes, but it keeps getting louder. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, you had asked a question. I'm sorry, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, John Wong, or Harrington. Or, okay. Um, you had asked a question about what bond council might comfortable with going forward and issuing the bonds. From my perspective, we're comfortable going forward um, today based on the fact that CEQA compliance is, has been fully formed. Um, the second thing I want to add, though, uh, in terms of, and it's it's a nice, it's a good thoughtful suggestion about carrying forward the suggestion until the next meeting. Uh, one chicken and egg issue, though, is in order to carry forward the 2019 cap, uh, uh, an IRS form needs to be filed on February 15th. I didn't, I didn't check to see when the next sit like meeting is. It's February 11th. Okay. February 12th. Okay, so that's that's right, right, right. But that's I just want to mention that. that that's okay, that's down fine. The wire. <laughs> Deadlines I, I are figured, good. I, I figured I had to mention that. In the yeah. Interest of, and and you you all having that information. Yes. Thank you. Yes, we appreciate that. And we're doing great off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Members? I, I agree. Okay, so is there a motion? Do we need a motion? No. Do we need a motion? No. You can just table on your own until the February meeting. Okay, so we're going to table uh, this item until uh, the February 12th meeting, <laughs> and we will come back um, more educated and hopefully confident that this project
is going to meet all of the Federal Railroad Administration requirements. Okay. Uh, item number, next item, public comment. Any general public comment? Okay. Seeing none, then we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.